Uh, good morning, and can I welcome members to the 14th meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2013. Can I remind members, uh, please ensure that all electronic devices are switched off at all times, because they do interfere with the sound system. Um, the uh, next item this morning is an oral evidence session on our inquiry into decision-making on whether to take children into care. Uh, this is the uh, second formal oral evidence session of the inquiry. Uh, this morning we will focus on the theme of ensuring that all voices are heard in the decision-making process. Um, prior to taking oral evidence, we undertook a series of visits and meetings, uh, and we indeed, as members will remember, met a, a group of young people who had been in care. We also met parents, um, foster parents and uh, parents with learning disabilities. Uh, these visits uh, and indeed these evidence sessions, oral evidence sessions, uh, will indeed uh, inform our report, uh, and those evidence sessions will of course help us in forming the questions uh, to the panel this morning. Can I welcome to the committee Tam Bailey, Scotland's Commissioner for Children and Young People, uh, Liz Ray, uh, the National Learning and Development Lead of Who Cares Scotland, and Andy Miller, Business and Partnerships Manager uh, from the Scottish Consortium for Learning Disability. Uh, good morning uh, to you all. Uh, before I uh, ask uh, for questions from the rest of the committee, can I begin uh, with a, a question about a specific issue that has come up in written evidence? Uh, and it came specifically from People First Scotland, who stated, and let me just read what they said, international research shows that about two out of every five children born to parents with learning disabilities are permanently removed from their care. Um, and it, it, this was also stated by uh, some other groups. I wonder whether uh, the panel members feel that that level of removal of children is appropriate, um, and in general, what are your views about the way parents with learning disabilities are treated with regards to their children uh, by professionals? Uh, Mr Miller, can I start with you? Sure. Good morning. Um, I should say that we, the Scottish Consortium for Learning Disability, um, work closely with People First Scotland in this issue of uh, supporting parents with, with learning difficulties and uh, I certainly agree with um, w what they've quoted in terms of the, the, the rate of removal of children whose parents have learning difficulties. Um, uh, the research in this area isn't, isn't really um, that, that uh, robust, though that figure comes uh, largely from, from England, who, who did um, some, some pretty thorough uh, research. There's been nothing like it in, in Scotland, but there's no reason to think that the levels are, are significantly different in Scotland. So the figures, uh, four out of 10 or, or even higher, other estimates have, have said five or even six out of 10 uh, children who's, who have parents with learning difficulties. Um, our own view, the, the Scottish Consortium for Learning Disability, is that that is uh, too high. I don't actually know what the figures are for other um, uh, uh, vulnerable children who have uh, parents with addiction problems or mental health difficulties or so. It, it might be equally high, but uh, it certainly feels high and um, the figure on its own is quite bold, but if you take that alongside the experiences of parents with learning difficulties, that they find it really difficult to get the right support that they need to parent, um, or even any support at all, I think there's a strong feeling, we, we certainly hold the view, that with better support for parents, that number would drop significantly. Thank you. Um, Liz Ray, do you have any comments on this area? We do a, a very little amount of work um, with children with disabilities um, and our experience tends to be um, that children who um, are looked after, who have disabilities, are generally looked after um, from a, a perspective of education rather than care. Um, so, to be honest, our experience in this area is fairly limited. Um, yeah, I mean, less than 2% of your children are looked after at any one time, so those figures are significantly higher. It needs to be borne in mind, though, that the definition of learning difficulties is very wide. Uh, so I think, you, in terms of looking at that figure and what it means, you'd need to give a bit more scrutiny than just that uh, that, that blanket uh, definition. But it has to be said that we don't provide sufficient support to our parents who are in vulnerable situations, including those parents with learning disabilities. Uh, I mean, I had the pleasure of uh, working alongside the uh, uh, People First in terms of uh, look, hosting a uh, round table, really just to explore uh, some of the issues that are underneath that. 
Uh, I think there's a general issue of support to parents in Scotland. We might get a chance to talk about that. Uh, and there's a specific issue uh, about the parents with uh, learning disabilities. I can't say what, that, uh, what would be an acceptable percentage because of what I said about in terms of the definition. Uh, but my impression is that we can and should be doing more uh, to support parents with learning disabilities uh, in terms of the rearing of their children. I, I, thank you very much for that. I, I accept what um, you've all said on this issue, but I suppose the question is, is it appropriate that the level is, if it is correct, it's two out of five? Um, uh, it's a very difficult area, obviously, uh, to discuss, but clearly um, parents who have particular difficulties, whatever they happen to be, and we're talking about learning disabilities here, but um, it is almost inevitable that uh, those parents are more likely to have their children uh, removed and put into care. Um, because, effectively, the rights of the child, in this case, uh, for proper uh, care and upbringing um, is what's our, what is our priority. So, therefore, is it surprising that it's uh, two out of five if it is that? Um, and is it not appropriate that those children are removed if there are problems in those households because of those particular disabilities? Mr Miller. Um, yeah, I think we would certainly say that, that um, what's most important is is the well-being of the of the child in these in these families, and so the rights of the the parents um, uh, has to be uh, secondary to that. One point I'd I'd want to make quite strongly, though, is that these these rights shouldn't be held against each other, and that often the the rights that parents have to um, uh, effective support actually promotes the well-being of the the child, and so. Uh, I think it's a false dichotomy to, to set the rights of the children against the rights of the parents, and what we should be looking at is the rights of the, the rights of the family. Where there are circumstances where um, uh, the children's well-being is seriously uh, compromised, then yeah, you, of course you need to look at, at removal. But but that's just a, a snapshot of a family when you get to that when you get to that point. And always w in situations where. Um, a child is removed. There's a, there's a build-up to that point that might be weeks or um, or years uh, long, and I think that um, in all situations, whether it's parents with learning difficulties or or, or uh, some other kind of vulnerability, um, it's really um, good and important that that we look to see what kind of support those families need. Um, uh, is it available? Who from? How long for? Um, what, what's going to help? How do you avoid the state taking over from the parents? Um, and instead, how do you build up the capacity of the parents to, to be more effective on their own? Um, when do you pull out the support? All, all those questions are, are really important. And if we get the answers to those questions right, then, uh, then I think those, you'll see those numbers coming down. Um, is, is your view that uh, professionals are using, or should I say, some professionals are using uh, the fact that parents are, uh, have a learning disability as a shorthand for effectively a reason to remove those children. I think there's a bit of evidence for that, that, that some uh, professionals um, see someone with a learning disability and, and just assume incompetence. Uh -huh. um, and uh, and there have been there have been occasions when when that's been the the, the written evidence in reports as the, the reason for for removal. Now that that's that can't be the case now officially. That can't be the case, and there needs to be other reasons beyond beyond just having a, a learned disability. Given that hopefully our views have changed on this particular point, have you seen any evidence to reflect the change? There's some really good evidence. There's some really good support. Uh, given to parents with learning difficulties across the country, um, some some organisations are are getting better. Uh, some national organisations like Aberlour uh, are are doing some really good work in Dundee and Aberdeen and and other places. Um, uh, there's some really good examples in in South Ayrshire in the in the um, social work team there. Um, but it is but it is patchy, and one of the main difficulties is that there tends to be uh, a culture in children and family social work of short-term interventions because that's what um, uh, traditionally they've, they've found uh, works best and, and, and now of course there's, there's more of a 
financial uh, imperative to have short-term interventions, you go in, fix the problem, or make it make it good enough, and then and then withdraw. But actually, for a lot of parents with learning difficulties, that that isn't effective. It it doesn't work. And so when you when social work puts in that support, which they're used to seeing um, uh, being effective, and it isn't then that's just going to compound any uh, attitudes they've got that, that the parents just aren't up to it. If you look at the culture of um, adult learned disability services, there's an acceptance that long-term support is, is what's needed. And many adults with learned disabilities in Scotland get, get lifelong support, and that's just that is the, that's the norm. Um, and, so there's, and so there's a culture clash between children and family social work and uh, adult learned disability social work. Thank you very much. Uh, we may well come back to this subject as we go through the morning, but uh, I want now to turn to uh, questions from George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning. I'm going to ask about the hearing system and listen to views of young people and vulnerable adults. At a previous meeting, Malcolm Schaefer of SCRA said the system could do a lot better on involving young people and vulnerable adults. Now, given that there's been a new emphasis in training in children's here in Scotland, and there's developments in children's advocacy. Do you think there's enough be now being done to ensure that young people and vulnerable adults are getting a voice within the system? I'd like to answer. Um, no, um, I suppose it's, it's my response. Um, I think the process for children and their families of attending the hearing <clears throat> is, is, is fraught with a lot of difficulty. Um, you could have up to 10, 12 people in a room, and it's very difficult, even though you've been given the opportunity to have your say, it's very difficult if you feel under pressure or intimidated to, to actually for a child to speak honestly. Um, parents quite often are so intimidated themselves by the, the procedures that they don't contribute effectively. Um, often they are aggressive or angry or upset, and that's perceived, that, that, that then makes them perceived in a particular way um, by panel members and, and can affect decision making. So oh, the structures as they are on the surface would allow everybody a voice, but I think participation is different to being allowed to speak. In order to participate effectively, you actually have to, um, you have to feel safe to be able to, to say what you have to say. Um, you have to feel it's going to be listened to. You have to feel that you'll be respected. And very often um, when, you're, when, when families go along to children's hearings, they're so stressed by the whole process that um, they don't feel either considered, respected or listened to. Being at a hearing is stressful because you're in front of a tribunal that can make life-changing decisions. And I don't think that you can take that out of the consideration. I'm very pleased that the committee wants to home in on the views of the child. I'm pleased at people paying much more attention to how we elicit the views of children and young people and take those into account in decision making. But this is a stressful process regardless, and we just have to acknowledge that. Uh, and I know that some of the practices have developed. Uh, I've seen evidence where committee chairs, for instance, speak in private to, to the child. Uh, I'm just I'm tempted to actually, I mean, I'm, I'm a public figure, uh, but I've got things that I don't want people to know about me. In fact, you're public figures, and my guess is that you've got things that you don't want people to know about you. And I would just ask you to think, place yourself as a child. Just think of those things that are private to you and whether you would be prepared to share it with, for instance, say the, the convener cleared the room. Would you share your private secrets with that person? Now, I'm not asking you to do that, but the... <laughs> I understand that. But these are the kind of things and expectations that we are placing on children. Now, it, that means that this is quite a difficult, tricky process to try to get to what a child is actually thinking and feeling, taking out all of those other pressures uh, that are acting on them. I spend my life trying to tell people to listen harder to children and young people. I spend a lot of time trying to figure out the best ways of getting the views of children and young people. So I am very pleased at the efforts that have been made within the hearing system, but I also don't uh, take that lightly.
These are quite difficult circumstances and we should be doing everything that we can to try and get the trust of the child and the young person, make sure that we're alongside them, make sure that they feel confidence that not only will they be able to say what they feel, say what they genuinely think, but also that that will be taken account of. And you'll have heard there are many times where children don't feel right, that that's the case. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liz Smith. C could I just continue that theme? Because I, I think it's, it's a very important one. It's a very difficult one. And notwithstanding what you said, Mr Miller, I think you described it as the false dichotomy between um, parents uh, and children. It should really be about the family. And I entirely agree with you on that. However, that's really quite difficult to drill down on that. And it's been put to us when we've spoken to uh, groups that, um, just as Mr Bailey has said, that they don't feel listened to. Are there quite a number of circumstances where it is actually better uh, to hear uh, privately from the child uh, without the parent uh, being there or parents being there and vice versa that uh, there are circumstances where it's better to hear from the parent when the child's not there because you know, we, we have to balance the rights of both of them and I think that's probably one of the biggest difficulties that we have uh, in making a judgment about that. Could, could you just expand a little bit on it? Yeah, I should, I should say I probably don't have a, um, a, a balanced view or, or a, a, a rounded view uh, about this because, because more of my work is, is with parents with learning difficulties than with children with learning difficulties that, that are going through the children's hearing, let me say. Um, but what I would say is, is that um, I recognise that, that very often the views of the parents aren't the same as the views of the child. Um, and, and so I would say whatever works um, to, to listen properly and well to, to both sides is, is good. Do you generally find it easier um, in a situation with learning difficulties uh, to elicit the information that is required to help the child and the family um, if they are spoken to separately? Um, to be honest, I, I haven't much experience of, of that happening, that, that either the parents or, or, or the child will learn difficulties has, has been spoken to separately. Um, what, what both would say is that, is that just as, uh, as my two colleagues have said, is that there are a lot of um, practical difficulties, um, the, the practical realities of, of the children's hearing system does make it really difficult to, to, to get to the to get to the number of what people want to say and what's what's important to, to, to people, what hasn't been mentioned yet specifically, I think, is the both the timescales of, of the hearings and the the fact that a lot of the written information that's been considered is is inaccessible to to uh, both parents and children with, with learning disabilities. That, that's an interesting point you raise. Could, can I just ask the panel about this process? I mean, obviously, the 2010 legislation has made things a little bit better. What else do you feel we have to do uh, now uh, in ensuring that we are getting better information from families uh, through the children's hearing system? What do we have to do with the children's hearing system to make that process a bit better, rather than just the administrative changes about time scales and paperwork, etc.? Um, when a process has changed just now, it's been a very long uh, process in terms of the reform of the hearing system. I'm, I'm tempted to let that bed down. I hear good things about people's inclinations and approaches in terms of listening to children and young people. I've already laid out how tricky an area uh, that, that, that that is. Um, if there's something that, that, that could benefit us all, it would be consistent, more consistent assessment. Uh, uh, and so to give the hearing, the confidence to make some of the difficult decisions that they have to make. You've already heard evidence about inconsistencies uh, in terms of the assessment. We're, we are much better informed about attachment theory and how that uh, will impact in children's development. Uh, and we have to keep plugging away to make sure that we provide the hearings with best informed evidence-based uh, uh, recommendations, which will give them hopefully more confidence in making some of the, the difficult permanent decisions uh, for uh, children and young people. Listening to children and young people is part of that, but of course a, a very high percentage of the children that are coming into care 
are actually under two years of age. These are the children that we are most concerned about. These are the children where you're not going to get a view from the child. What you will have is an assessment about the attachment, the assessment about that, what circumstances can best nurture uh, that child. So for me, it's about the systems that we put around about the, the hearing system. And really, the key one there is assessments. And I know you've heard plenty of evidence uh, on whether assessments are well-informed or evidence-based or indeed uh, consistent. Can, can I just finish, uh, convener, on the point that you, it's your understanding that you feel, <coughs> with all your contacts, th contacts that things are improving? Well, I certainly hear an awful lot more talk about listening to the views and the value of, of being placed on uh, children and young people. I, I think there are many things that we, we can do. Uh, I mean, for instance, there's uh, the advocacy provision within the Act. I, I just beg a little bit of caution on that. My experience, the people that are the best advocates for children and young people are those whom they trust. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a third party. Uh, and so there has to be a balance struck. Uh, and I've, that's twice that I've mentioned now about the need for children to actually trust in who they're relating to, trust in who they're dealing with. Uh, and it won't always be uh, an independent advocate. Uh, and there's enough people around the table. Uh, you know how intimidating it is to have lots of people around the table. Well, we as the panel do. Thanks very much. Can I just push a little further on this, uh, Mr Bailey? Um, is it, I mean, you said earlier you had some caution about that, I mean, in terms of uh, giving it a chance to bed down. Is it too early to really be certain about the, imp uh, the impact of the changes? But they're not even, in, yeah. they're not even come in yet. The intention, I mean, I appreciate, I appreciate that, but in terms of the views in, inside the community and the professionals? Uh, we've taken a very long time to get to where we are uh, just now. Uh, I welcome the committee's focus on that really critical issue of how decisions are taken uh, with regard to children. I'm interested in how you will have an impact on or what, what impact you expect to have on the processes as a result of whatever report the, that you actually publish. Uh, but I'm encouraged, but as I say, particularly on that issue about listening to children and young people, I think that we could do a lot more in terms of familiarising children with the process, about getting alongside them. But all of those are the kind of things I think people are looking at just now. The forums that they fill in, the way that their, their views are, are given. But I've given you some limitations on that. And I go back to even if you clear the room and it's done in private, would you expect that child to tell some of the things that are most traumatising and most hurtful? Yeah, I was just wondering about the, the viewers because it has been a long time and it was a, a somewhat difficult experience um, in getting to where we are in terms of the, the Children's Hearing Act, etc. Um, and I just wondered whether the views of those involved in it, which were, um, uh, they had some heightened concerns at the time, whether that has settled down. Yeah, I think it's already been said to the committee that the hearing system has got a long way to go to uh, uh, ensure that it gets the views of children and young people effectively. That's partly because it's tricky, it's partly because we're on a journey to actually, for me, in Scotland, we've got a long way to go to say that we regularly, routinely elicit, take and value the views of children and young people. But I think some of the most encouraging noises are actually through the children's hearing system. Okay, thank you very much. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Convener. Um, in the evidence we've taken so far, there's been reference made to uh, a lack of consistency across councils in terms of their approach. And uh, it ranges from councils being too quick to remove children to the rule of optimism, let's say, where there's always the inclination to give the family one more chance. In terms of... Uh, parents with learning disabilities and so forth. Where do you think that balance lies in general? Um, I think, um, sorry to be so slow, I'm, try I'm trying to uh, uh, get my head around the question because there's, there's quite a lot of factors I think in, involved there and I don't think it's just a question of being sort of soft on families as opposed to hard on families. Um, there's, there's, there's no consistency about the, the support given to, to, to families with this parental learning disability. I mentioned some of the, the, the good areas of practice, some 
organisations and some geographical areas. Um, but there's, but there's, there's no consistent good practice across, across the country, I, I would say. In terms of, in terms of um, uh, speed to, to, to uh, start child protection procedures or uh, removal procedures or anything like that, um, I, don't, I don't know that there's consistency. Um, but, but my, um, my real thing, I have to say, is, is, is the, the bit of the process before those, those things happen. I, I totally agree with, uh, with Tam Bailey about the need for uh, consistent uh, assessments. Um, and um, as far as parental learn disability goes, there are some examples of good assessment tools being used in, in good ways, but no consistency there. But I have to say, um, all the component parts are, are available. There are, good, there are good assessment tools, there's good training for, for working with parents with learning disabilities. It's just not, uh, there, there's no consistent model across the country. The meeting that Tam Bailey referred to, uh, that he, he co-chaired with People for Scotland a couple of weeks ago, looked at this very question uh, and the, the, the approach of a supported parenting model was, was broached and the, I have to say the whole room um, agreed that it was a good model not just for families where there's parental learning disability but for families um, that are in a range of vulnerable circumstances and, and um, that's an approach that's based on a, a number of key principles but, but basically one that puts, that puts families at the centre and has support that's, that's, um, uh, that, that builds the capacity of parents to, uh, to support better and if that was adopted as a, as, a, as a consistent model across the country, then I think you'd, you'd find the results that you're looking for. Just to extend the question slightly, um, do you think that professionals who are involved in making these decisions at the moment have been given the skills to do so? In other words, do you think that uh, professionals have been given the support themselves which allow them to reach a, a fair judgment in these matters? No, I know, I know that they haven't. I know, I know there are a lot of, um, for example, there are a lot of children and family social workers that are totally unaware of the uh, Scottish Good Practice guidelines for supporting parents with learning difficulties, which, which were produced in, in 2009. Um, some, some are totally unaware, some are aware of them, but, but say that they don't use them in, in, in practice. Uh, many say that they've, they've had no uh, training in, uh, in these assessment tools we're, we're talking about, so no. Uh, people, people, a, a lot of uh, social workers don't have the tools they need. Do any others in the panel? Have I mean, I sense a concern amongst the committee about parents with learning disabilities and consistency of practice. I think it, part of the reason that uh, um, it's views and opinions is because we don't actually have hard evidence on that, and you could do worse, or you could do. You, it would be worth recommending that this is an area that is actually looked at in terms of trying to get to good quality information. Uh, just while we're on it, uh, on disability, uh, uh, I produced a report last year looking at consistency of uh, services for children with disabilities, uh, and one of the key things that came up there was indeed uh, different approaches tools uh, and assessments being used across the country for children uh, with disabilities. And I've just heard recently anecdotally about uh, some concerns about children who with disabilities, parents not receiving appropriate support, children ending up in care. Now that's a, a pattern which you could extend to other uh, vulnerable groups, but I'll be interested to actually look at how consistent we are uh, with our approach to children with disabilities. Just picking up on a point that was made there, there seems to be an issue about actually having any reliable data with which to analyse this, which, which seems to me a little bit astounding given the fact that uh, this, is, this is not a new issue. Mm. You know, it's been going on for years. You would think that councils and uh, the various bodies involved would be getting the statistics together, would be looking at the figures, would be trying to analyse exactly what's happening where and what can be done better and where there's good practice, and yet we seem to be getting told it doesn't happen. You may want to highlight that in your conclusions. I mean, I, I, I grew up with the, the children's hearing system, uh, and I, I and many others are in admiration of the approach, uh, but the research base the evidence base is actually rather thin uh, and we need to actually make sure that we properly uh, monitor and research and evaluate uh, the outcomes for children uh, that go through the 
John Tiernes. It's the lack of consistency that you've been talking about. Consistency between professionals, or is it consistency or lack of consistency um, between local authority areas? I would say both. Uh, you only need to look at the rates of children who are looked after, uh, which is regularly uh, produced. Uh, and there are variations. Some of that can be accounted for by levels of poverty, concentrations of poverty, but not all of it. So you will have councils with similar profiles in terms of their socioeconomic uh, circumstances have got quite different rates of children being uh, taken into care, children who are looked after. Uh, and that begs a question as to, so what else is going on there? So that there are inconsistencies there. I think the direction of travel of getting it right for every child and integrated working is actually the way forward uh, for more consistent practice and understanding of different approaches of different uh, services and professions within the system, such as social work, education, police, housing, uh, health. Uh, there are... Um, very long-standing uh, issues about common approaches, uh, but as, and there are some good examples of co-location of those staff developing uh, similar shared practices. Uh, but we've got a bit, of way, a bit of a way to go there. Thank you very much, uh, Joan. Thank you very much, convener. Yes, um, uh, Mr. Miller mentioned the Scottish Consortium for Learning Disabilities uh, Good Practice Guidance, and uh, you were very clear that it, it wasn't being consistently ap applied. I, I take it from what you're saying, it's, just, it's not possible at all to quantify how many authorities are, you, are using it. You couldn't hazard a guess and say it was <laughs> above or below 50% even. Uh, no, I, no. I, I couldn't. We've, we've not... Um... We've not been able to do any widespread research at all. We did a, we did a very small scale snapshot survey a couple of years ago uh, on the usage of the guidelines. And it was um, what, com what came out was that uh, health professionals used it a lot more than, than social workers. Um, um, but uh, in terms of consistency of, of um, use by, by, say, social workers across the country, no, the survey wasn't big enough to, to highlight that. I don't know how, how familiar the other two panel members are with the guidelines and whether they would be able to say, for example, is it, is it in line, are they in line with GERFIC? Would, that, would there be any reason why the social workers wouldn't be using them? Absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, the, the, um, the, the recommendations in the guidelines are, are very much along, along the lines of the um, support to parenting approach that I, that I was talking about a few minutes ago, which is completely in line with, uh, with GARFEC in terms of early intervention and, and uh, uh, better, better joint working between organisations and, and so on. So, yep, completely in line. I mean, the committee will be aware of the status of guidance uh, and guidelines, uh, especially in an area uh, where there's a growing awareness of the need to do better. Uh, so, yet again, that might be one area that you might want to, to highlight. Just to pick up on the point Andy's made, though, uh, I mean, there, there's a model that's been developed uh, that's been called supported parenting. Uh, which I think is very much in line with the aspirations of the National Parenting Strategy uh, to make sure that, the, and it, it provides principles of providing support to families, families where there are vulnerability. Uh, so it's another step along the way to look at how we provide better support to families where there are particular vulnerabilities. In this instance, the supported parent uh, is looking at families with uh, uh, learning disability. Uh, but I think it's ap applicable uh, across the board. The model, that model that you outline, is, is, is that apparent in pilot schemes? Do we have specific examples of the way that model has actually helped families? Um, yep. Uh, uh, I mentioned Aberlauer uh, earlier on, and they're, they've got a, a small um, support parenting model going in, in, uh, in Dundee. And um, uh, I mentioned South Ayrshire as well. Um, there's a there's a team within the, the children and families team there, the, the children with disabilities team, and the work they do is, certainly follows the, the principles of, uh, of supported parenting. But as I say, it's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a broad ap approach based on, on certain principles. And so I, um, it's the kind of thing that, that if, if, um, 
It's the kind of thing you can be doing without calling it supportive parenting, if you know what I mean. But these are certainly places that I've been, I've seen it working, and it's having really good outcomes for, for children. Yep. Do you have any suggestions as to how we could have that approach more widely applied? Well, I think the, the, um, the National Parenting Strategy is an ideal place for, for, for something like that to, uh, to sit. I'd agree with Tam that it's, it's a model that's, that's suitable for, for a much wider population than, than families with parental learning disability. Um, and, uh, and I think to have, a, to have a supported parenting strategy sitting within the, the National Parenting Strategy would be, would be, uh, would be great and very effective. And, and just lastly, to go back to a point that I found interesting that you made at the very out outset, um, Mr Miller, where you talked about a culture clash in social work practice between long-term support for people with learning disabilities, which was the model, and short-term in intervention, which was the model for child protection. Uh, how has that sort of culture clash come about and, and what can we do to overcome it? Um, well, I think one, one way to address it would, would be to have a, a, a supported parenting service which, uh, which bridges the, um, adult services and, and children's services so that it, it can have a, a proper focus on the, on the family. Now, whether that would sit within social work or, or not, I don't, I don't know. It's not, not anything of... Uh, Worked through, but but it's certainly um, a very common uh, scenario that there's that there's not good working between uh, between children, families, teams, and adult adult teams. Not just because of that, uh, the question of different cultures. Um, so I think it, I think it's it's an area that we do need to to look at. Um, but but having a, a specific service that that deliberately um, specifically straddles those those two cultures, I think would be would be a start. But, but I don't have any expertise in, in, in areas where, other than, than learned disability, uh, and, and Liz might well have other examples of you know, whether it's addictions or mental health problems. I could really see um, the supported parent and model working with um, young care leavers. Um, the numbers of young care leavers whose children themselves are brought into care, um, quite often because the, they don't have the, they haven't developed the skills to parent. They haven't learned how to parent in the same way that children who live at home with their families, you know, absorb that automatically. Um, I think that there is a, a there's a real conflict, especially where um, young care leavers have been the child who was cared for previously, um, and they they're, they're looked at differently when they're adults and it's their own children that are in care, um, and they've been brought up in that process, um, and they, they don't know their own role. They haven't learned their own role. Um, I think very often social workers look at care leavers um, because of the problems they've experienced in the past. They see the problems rather than the person with the potential that they, they have to become, um, you know, to grow and develop. Um, and that can often pose problems. I think that the, the, the need to protect children will obviously take, take precedence. But I think the two can go hand in hand where pa pa parents are encouraged to develop and grow um, and have the opportunity maybe to have their children return to them at some point. I think too, all too often we make decisions based on what we know because a, a, an adult has, has learning disabilities or because we know that the Fidix had, had difficulties and issues themselves in the past um, and effectively we know their, their care history. Um, I think that's where some of the conflict can come in. Uh, it's value judgments. Do you want to add anything to that, Mr Bailey? If we're on the subject of care leavers, yes. And the basic point is they leave care far too early. I know you're concentrating your decisions about coming into care, but many of them go back home. Go back to homes where there has been little change, little input, uh, and we know the trajectories of many of our young people who leave care, who come up in the criminal justice system or addictions or mental health. Uh, now, we have a lack of evidence as to the overall outcomes for children leaving care, because it tends to be very small scale surveys uh, that uh, track, uh, or sorry, at point of destination are assessing how many young people in Pullman have been in care, how many uh, in our, uh, who are in mental health services have been in care. It tends to be short term. We don't have uh, an overall uh, <coughs> picture 
of the outcomes for youngsters leaving care. And what we do have tends to be on the negative side. Uh, so again, I think that's another task that we should be much more robust at collecting the evidence for young people leaving care and tracking them right the way through. They still leave age 16, 17. And young people leaving home nowadays in the UK leave in their mid-20s. We have to ask ourselves, why is that the case? And I know that the bill coming in is making proposals about a duty to assess and support uh, young people up to the age of 25. We have to make sure that we also attend to the very early age that young people leave care. 16, 17, quite frankly, for me, is too early. Very helpful, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Mr Miller, you, you talked earlier about, if just before I bring in Claire Adamson, can I just clarify this point? That your, the good practice guidance for supporting parents with learning disabilities is, is not, as far as you're aware, is not consistently used across the country or it's uh, used some places but not used in other places. Why, why is that the case? I don't... I don't. I, I don't, no, I, no I, don't, I don't think I don't think it's that people don't agree with it. I think um, I think I think what it's saying is is quite challenging. I think one of the points that I, uh, I realised I hadn't made yet was that there's, I think there's a real practical difficulty with the question of of, of early intervention, and, and the simple reason is that there are so many families uh, in crisis. And the examples that, that I gave of, of supported parenting working in Dundee and South Ayrshire actually wasn't wasn't completely true because one of the principles of supported parenting is that it should be available right from the start. But actually there's no examples that I, that I know of in Scotland where um, good supported parenting is available to families who, who, who weren't in crisis. It's often, very, very often services kick in because there are child protection concerns. And that was certainly the case in Dundee. And so one of the good outcomes is that both the children who are supported are, are now off the child protection register, they're doing better at school and, and so on. All, all the indicators are, are great, but that service only became available um, uh, after there was a crisis. And that's the same in South Ayrshire as well and anywhere, anywhere that, that you look. Because on the face of it, it's expensive to put in supports when, they're, when over here, there are, there are other families with, with children on the child protection register and so on. And, and here you just, have a, you just have a mum with learning difficulties who's just come out of hospital and there are no significant problems yet. So, so where are you going to divert the resources to? It'll be, it'll be the child protection. But I think if, um, I think if, we're, if we're serious about, um, about supported parenting, then we need to take that into consideration. And, and of course, that's exactly what, what Garfek is saying, is what the parenting strategy are, are saying. But to make it happen in practice, I think, is really, really challenging. And I think that's one reason the guidelines uh, haven't been used <coughs> consistently. Okay. Thank you very much. Claire Adamson. Um, thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, we've already mentioned Garfek quite a bit this morning. Um, and a lot of the evidence sessions that we had um, talked about the potential for GERFEC and certainly um, a lot of the professionals involved were very um, interested and hopeful about how cross-disciplinary um, working might work with education and health and social services. But g given that we have such a, um, a sort of geographic difference in, in, in how current guidelines are applied and, and, and the outcomes for, for young people. Do you think GERFEC is going to give that, that, that um, impetus to, to change that, that people are hopeful for? Okay. Uh, I'm going to go back to the assessment issue uh, and picking up and identifying children where there's vulnerability. Uh, the bill that's pending is made a uh, named person, uh, will be part of uh, the legislative uh, proposals. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, in the health sector, there are insufficient health visitors to be able to carry out the duties of named person. This is our main universal service that goes into our youngest families on the basis of identifying those that require additional services. There are additional requirements now in terms of the reinstatement of the health visitor assessment at 27 to 30 months, uh, and the bill itself will place uh, an expectation of named person on health visitors. This is a profession which has suffered over recent years, and indeed uh, there is a shortage. You have health visitors of 
350 caseloads and more in some instances. If this is a cornerstone of us picking up or providing universal service to our youngest families, then we have to take it much more seriously uh, than we do at present. That will assist in identifying children who require additional services. And I know you've heard evidence from the Chairs of the Child Protection Committee that for those children who we identify, our systems are pretty robust. But there are too many children where we are missing, where we are missing the poor attachment between the parent and the child. Too many children where we could, in fact, improve the outcomes, which may avert uh, uh, later episodes of children coming into care. So that's just one, one example of uh, at, at that age group. It will take a whole number of things. Uh, and I, I'm encouraged by the development, but we have to get a move on. That's... Us. I think when multidisciplinary working works well, it works beautifully. Um, but there are so many instances when it doesn't work, um, when agencies um, don't engage well as well as they could, but other agencies, there's a lack of sometimes of information being shared, um, and that can have an impact on services that young people receive. Um, as I said before, when it works well, it works really well, and it's how we get that consistency across the board to make sure that it works well more often and more frequently. Okay. Okay, uh, Neil Bibby. Thanks. I just want to go back to the issue of uh, providing support to, to families and, 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 and children. Um, I think you've all mentioned various uh, different things. The SCLD referred to uh, the right support should be available from the start. Who cares? I've talked about improved family support. And, uh, Mr Bailey, you've talked about um, the, the support to families and, and the, the Children's Scotland Act 1995 and the welfare of children. I just wanted to, to ask you, what, what are the key, uh, kind of key practical things that you think um, should be done to support families uh, or support children being returned to families? I, don't, I think, Mr Bailey, you mentioned the NSPCC New Orleans inter intervention model as an example, but just to see if there was any kind of practical things that you think we should be doing? Yeah, the core of this is about good assessment. Good assessment that allows confident decisions uh, to be made. Uh, either that the child stays within that family environment with the right support, or that we make permanent decisions, make permanent uh, arrangements for that child outside of the, the, the family home. And I'm encouraged by the trialling of the uh, New Orleans model because it's actually take, it's trying to be robust and seeing, so does this work in a Scottish context? One of the key elements of that is timescales. Different timescales for children as opposed to parents. Children, the clock is ticking in terms of the development. I've mentioned attachment theory. We now know an awful lot more about that. Uh, because of the research that's been used over the last 25 years. Uh, so there's a sense that a decision just to leave a child and a, a, a no decision is actually a decision that will impact on that child's well-being. So we have to make sure that we don't we, we get the timing right and that we get the quality uh, of decision making right. Uh, and I think if that model proves that it can, we can have better outcomes for children and young people, then we're always looking to scale up. Uh, but I'm encouraged by the, the, the measured approach that they're taking to that. Uh, and so for me, it's good assessment and timely uh, intervention on children. Does anyone else have any points? I think before I, we bring children into care, we need to... We need to consider the impact that the process of being accommodated actually has on them in terms of their attachments within their, their families, their communities. Children suffer significant loss as a result of being accommodated. And very often um, the child themselves is identified as being the problem, um, either because they've offended or there have been issues within the family that um, are associated with the child. Quite often children are removed, there's work done with the child um, you know, to, to try to address some of the issues the child has. There's no work done with the families um, in many cases and children are returned back to situations that, that they came from previously We no additional work having been done with the families um, and that the situation perpetuates um, itself once again. I think that's something that has to be 
um, to be factored in um, when, you, when you are looking to remove children. Um, and and what, what do you think are the, the you know to ensure we've got an aim of supporting children and making um, sure we have the you know the right support in place? What, what do you think are the resource implications for, for looking at that as an aim? There are bound to be significant resource implications, but I think we children, when they leave care, inevitably go back to their families. Um, and quite often they've been away from their families for a number of years. They don't have the relationships that they had previously. Um, they often don't fit into their communities. Um, I think, although the, the, there is a, a significant resource implication, I think it's one that has to be looked at and factored in at the time that children are being accommodated, because the, the implications are so long term. Um, and actually to get the best outcome for the child, if there, there is a possibility for that child to go back home, you can work with the child in isolation. Um, the part of family, the family needs to be addressed. Um, and I think the, the cost of that has to be looked at and borne. I, I, I was struck earlier by the evidence that 90% of the hearing decisions follow the recommendation of the social worker. Uh, and I know that there was some emphasis placed on that. Uh, I actually looked at the, the, the figures. Uh, of the 1,686 cases that they looked at, 511 were continued hearings. There was or, or that they couldn't decipher, or they couldn't, there wasn't a clear social work recommendation. So in almost a third of the hearings that were looked at in that SCRA research, there was no decision which harks back to what I was saying about children who are left in situations, uh, that actually is a decision because that will impact on their well-being for good uh, or for bad. Uh, so I, yeah, the, we have to just you know, think through uh, some of the impact of our decision-making forum. Uh, and if you take that alongside the percentage of unplanned moves, that we are for those children in that survey. Now, it's only a sample. It's only 90 children, but it's, there's been quite a lot made of that. If you combine the non-decision with some of the, the, the well, it was 56 per cent, the majority of the moves, the impact on the children were unplanned. You can see where our system is, you know, not quite moving as fast as it could, uh, but also moving in unplanned ways, which could have detrimental effects on children's well-being, children's uh, uh, extended uh, future life chances. Claire, got a brief point on this. Yeah, yes. um, it was in relation to um, what we've already just discussed about. Um, the, the, fa the holistic view of the family not being taken into consideration as much. And one of the, the, the most worrying bits of evidence was from the care leavers at Who Cares Scotland who had um, been known to the social work department, but it was their own behaviour, if they became offended, that, that resulted in their um, removal from the home. Um, but the very great concern they had for younger siblings, and there seemed to be no input and no support there, um, with very similar outcomes for the younger siblings. And is there anything that's happening with, with, with changes in the, the children's hearing system with GERFEC that you think would improve that situation? Assessment. Tom mentioned assessment earlier. Um, what usually happens, every child's situation is assessed individually, so one child might be seen, um, the removal of one child might actually be seen to benefit the rest of the family. Um, I think very much um, it's about individuals, uh, individuals within that collective. Um, I think one of the things that our young people have struggled with is the fact that they have been removed and their siblings remain, and there's real, really great concerns about safety, um, or often great concerns about safety, because they're aware of things that perhaps they haven't shared with their social worker or, or shared with other people. Um, I, I don't have a hard and fast answer. Um, I think assessment is the way forward, um, making sure that there are robust assessment processes in place, that there are, uh, that are regularly reviewed, um, and that people, have, that children especially, have the opportunity to speak to an independent person about any issues or concerns that they might have. That's one of the things that I think is very often lacking for children who live at home. Um, children who are accommodated have access to advocacy. Children who live at home quite often are hidden. Um, and their issues um, quite often are hidden too. Can I just add, add something to, to what Tam and Liz have said about, about um, assessment processes? Yeah. I don't know how widespread this is, but, but um, I heard from a, a clinical psychologist who, who was at a, um, a children's hearing 
and was involved in, with, with a family. Um, clinical psychologists have, have extremely um, robust assessment uh, processes and they have training in, in, uh, in uh, carrying out assessments. But she was, she was quite alarmed that, that in this case that she was uh, observing, the assessment had been done by a social work assistant who um, uh, didn't seem to have had any, any training, didn't, didn't do any of the basic um, recording uh, of, of the information that, uh, that, that she would have done. For, for example, the social work assistant took no notes uh, uh, at, at the time of, of assessing uh, the, the, the family and produced uh, a report that, that to the clinical psychologist seemed very uh, sketchy and, and selective. And why that's worrying is, is really because of the, 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 the figure Tam said of the 90% the, the, the of cases where decisions are made um, that, that go along with the social work assessment. And so if that's, if that's going to be, uh, if that is how it is, then, then we need to make really sure that the social work reports are based on, on rock solid assessments and that doesn't seem to be the case at the moment. Um, in your submission, Mr Bailey, um, you're referring to uh, the number of episodes children experience before a permanent placement uh, is identified and you, you mentioned an uh, overly optimistic perspective of some of our most vulnerable families' capacity to change, but also uh, you raised the issue of the supports provided being insufficient to enable that change to be effective. Um, I think throughout our uh, inquiry that seems to be coming across that the support there for parents is, is, is very patchy at best. Um, um, given the, the whole thrust of government policies and preventative agenda, um, what, what would you say about the, the, the need for some consistent service being provided, but also about additional resource to be put in? Yeah, this is one of the tricky areas because uh, we are providing for increasing numbers of children who are looked after at present. Uh, um, in fact, that it's, it's at its highest since 81. Uh, um, but we also know that there's, or there is increasing concern about the number of children that are living with neglect and neglectful circumstances. And I think as I also said in my evidence that it's tempting to say that if provided with the right support, then you could prevent children coming into care. In fact, I repeated that today. Uh, but also, if we had proper oversight and monitoring of the circumstances for all of our children, it may well be uh, that there would be areas of concern that were highlighted that we had to move on. So it's difficult to, to know uh, what the impact of all of that would be, but I am quite sure uh, that we are missing children right now. Uh, that we are missing children where we should be providing additional support. That doesn't necessarily mean that those children have to be received into care, but we have to respond uh, and carry out the assessment. Is this the right place for this child to be nurtured? Is this the best option uh, for this uh, 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 child or children? Uh, so that's why I back things like the National Parent Programme uh, and getting it right. Nobody would argue with getting it right so that you actually get in uh, as, as early as you can. But we have to bring an element of good judgment uh, to all of that. And that's kind of where the system is, uh, doesn't have confidence to make some of the difficult decisions early on, with the result that children oscillate between home and care, home and care, and I've just given you some of the figures that are, lie underneath some of the, the SCRA decision making. Uh, and for too long, those children are left in limbo. Uh, and eventually, in many instances, those children come into care. And what we have to do is to reduce that movement, that change in circumstances, because these are the things that are most impact, have most impact on children's mental well-being, children's attachment, children's relationship, children's resilience uh, for for the future. So I, I that, that, that's where I, I that's why I home in on this business of assessment, timely uh, intervention, and a system that has the confidence to make some of the more difficult decisions on our children, and young people. I think you're right. I mean, I, I think you probably struggle to find them in the country who disagreed with the fine sentiments within all these documents, but. 
they have to be more than a document. They have to be something that actually means something on the ground, and you know, it, it, so that we don't just end up with social work um, being a, a, a crisis management service. Uh, you know, I think what we're hearing from people regularly is that there has to be some proactive service in there working with families. Um, is that the direction that we should be going in? But I've got the privilege of being part of the early years task force. This is our oppor opportunity for generational change. This is our opportunity to actually get in early uh, with our families to an, an understanding of some of the dynamic, uh, particularly in terms of attachment to the and the kind of behaviours that we should be supporting in parents. Uh, it's too early to say whether the, 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 the momentum will be maintained. I'm on the side of the hopeful because actually, as I say, this is our generational opportunity uh, to get it better, certainly for our, uh, for our um, younger children. Can I push on that and say that well, how, how that can be achieved without cash? I've already touched on health visitors, which I feel uh, strongly about. Uh, they are key in terms of a universal service and being able to not only provide support to families, but to identify those families where uh, additional supports are required. There is some provision in the bill that's coming through, but it won't kick in uh, until 2016. My view is that we should actually be doing things now that will improve those universal services. The health visitor element is just one small element, a bigger... Yes, it's going to take a whole number of, of, of changes. Uh, um, there's already a lot of development happening in the local areas. But it, I, I'm, I'm not privy to that right now because a lot of it's been initiated under the Early Years Collaborative, which is in the very early stages. Uh, we'll have a better idea in the coming months just exactly how that's, uh, that's unfolding and whether that is actually prompting some of the developments that are required to achieve some of the ambition uh, that's uh, outlined in the Early Years uh, framework and actually the Early Years Collaborative, I should say. Okay. Yeah, it's supplementary, based on what Mr Miller had s said a, a few moments ago about the uh, social work assistant uh, writing the report which had uh, concerned the clinical psychologist. Have we any idea how many reports are being written by social work assistants that are then used to make decisions? Is what percentage of these reports are written by assistants? No idea, I'm afraid. I don't know if that would be available from, from Scra. I don't think that information is collected currently. Um, I may be wrong. I'll, I'll stand corrected if it is. Is it something that would concern yourself, Mr Bailey? I think that I've already expressed a lot of concern with regard to uh, quality of assessments. It's not just about social work assessment. The model that I mentioned in terms of New Orleans has got uh, very specialist uh, assessment or, or staff that are uh, input into that. Uh, so that when the recommendation comes, it's not just about social work, it's about health, it's about uh, some clinical input as well. So it's a much wider, much more broad-based assessment uh, for that child. That's exactly what we need. It's not just based on, on one perspective. And, and if I could just add, I, 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 didn't, I didn't mean to, to, to damn social work assistants by that, by that example. It would be quite possible that social work assistants do an assessment very well and, and thoroughly, so simply having this, the, the figures of which assessments were done by qualified social workers, which by assistants, wouldn't necessarily be, uh, be too helpful. Thank you. Uh, Liam MacArthur. Thank you. Just following on from that point, I mean, you've all, I think, quite rightly laid heavy emphasis on the importance of the quality of the assessment in terms of giving the, the confidence that the decisions being taken are evidence-based, and uh, etc. I mean, obviously, there's a, a training component to that, and I think, Mr Miller, you were talking about that earlier in your evidence, but we've heard from the uh, Association of Directors of Social Work there's a very real problem in terms of um, uh, retaining experienced social, work, uh, social workers, and presumably... Um, better assessments will invariably flow from not just um, better training but also uh, longer experience. Is that something that um, rings bells with you, that is a concern in terms of the way the system works at the moment? Yeah, this, this is a long-standing uh, issue. I, I, I have the opportunity of speaking to uh, numerous social work directors. Uh, it's a common issue about maintaining the most experienced workers at the coal face, if you like, uh, to carry out these really uh, difficult, uh, complex uh, uh, matters. Um, there was a report uh, um, 
changing lives, about looking at uh, how we would uh, uh, reform social work in the 21st century. Uh, uh, one of the key recommendations of that was about the professional autonomy of the social worker to free them up to do the task rather than being weighed down uh, in terms of bureaucracy. Uh, my view is that we crank up the bureaucracy every time we respond to uh, tragic incidents. Uh, and what that does is it, it, it means that uh, social workers and social work profession uh, has got a heavier bureaucratic burden. Uh, and we're in a place where we wouldn't choose to be. And we have to find a way of lightening that load to allow people to actually flourish and do the job uh, which they came in to do. That is, it, is it your sense that there's a particular problem in terms of um, children and family social workers because of, as you say, the, the instances of perhaps high profile, very, very difficult and sensitive cases is, is greater in that area than it perhaps is in other areas? I can't comment for the whole of social work. I think you need to take advice from ADSW on that, but there's certainly an issue in terms of the particular pressures that uh, children and family social workers are under and, and the requirements of the task. And there was lots and lots of feedback from social workers uh, during that review uh, about the bureaucratic burden, uh, which takes away from the actual task, the skilled task that people come in to, to execute. And of course, there's a need for constant CPD. I mean, I mentioned the, uh, the, our growing knowledge in terms of attachment theory and understanding of that. Uh, the research on that just keeps coming. Uh, so there has to be some development of practice that takes account of that as well. You mentioned earlier the, the importance of health visitor and, and, and likely to be the named individual under the, 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 the upcoming legislation. I mean, obviously there are a range of professionals and indeed those in the third sector involved in, in this whole process. Is it your sense that there are particular professions or particular agencies that are easier to deal with um, uh, as part of that process or does it very much boil down to, to, to individuals within within the system? Are you talking about in terms of named person particularly? Uh, I, I mean the named person I, I suppose was um, the peg on which I was hanging it and, and, and clearly um, some of the concerns uh, that, that have, uh, have given rise to that are, are, are those that reflect the fact that, that, that perhaps those who are vulnerable, whether on the, on, in terms of parents or in terms of the, uh, the children, associate more or, or have greater confidence in particular individuals within the system. Is that a reflection of the role they perform or the reflection of the, the, uh, the individuals that they are? It's interesting because my, my experience is that children and young people tend not to be too bothered about the label of the person that they're working with. Uh, as long as they're engaging, as long as they're somebody that they can trust. Uh, it's we professionals that tend to get hung up in terms of the, the label that goes on, uh, you know, the, the, the boundaries. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is that I think there are, and I, I, I don't have a panoramic view of uh, the interagency working uh, in Scotland, but my hunch is that we are getting much better, certainly at coalface level, in terms of joint interagency working. Uh, so I, 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 but there are particular problems with particular responsibilities, and I highlighted the one that I, I've, uh, I've been talking about for a number of months now, which is the position of health visitor, just because of the numbers uh, and the need to actually improve that to be able to carry out the ambitions that are behind the name person within the legislation. And, and in terms of, say, parents with learning disab disabilities, I mean, is there, I mean, we, we certainly on one of the evidence sessions that we, that, um, that, that we took, there was a concern about the way in which certain professional services engaged with them, um, both in written form and in terms of, 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 of uh, orally in the meetings. Is that, is that a concern that we need to be reflecting on and, and, and perhaps making recommendations? Or? Um, well, certainly it's, it's, it's true that there's a very common fear of social work amongst parents with learning difficulties. And I have to say from the work that I've done, that's, that's, not, uh, it, that's not always based on, on experience. It, it, it's, um, there's one family that I, that I spoke to who, who, who had never had any contact with social work and yet were terrified of, of getting in touch to ask for help because they, because they were 
terrified that, that that's what social workers did. They, they took your kids away. And um, so, so I'm, not, I'm not putting the blame on social work, but, but I think that's a real key part of the dynamic with all the, with all the professionals. And it's, it's often much easier for parents who learn difficulties to accept support from, from other agencies, um, the third sector agencies, for, for example. Um, I, would, I would agree with Tam that generally, generally in terms of interagency working, I think it's getting better um, and has been for a while. But the other thing that I've noticed is wherever I've gone and asked if there are any formal protocols, uh, policies, whatever, uh, inter interagency protocols, it's almost almost never. Um, and so, so some, and so it often does depend on on the individuals in the scene. Thank you much. Can I thank the witnesses uh, for coming on this morning? It's been very helpful, um, and also helping us to kick off uh, these a number of oral evidence sessions on the inquiry. Uh, and I'm sure that the evidence you've given us this morning will give us lots to think about as we move forward to writing a report later in the year. Thank you very much. And can I suspend uh, for a few moments? Thank you.
Uh, the next item uh, on our agenda this morning is an oral evidence session on the post-16 bill and the draft Scottish Code of Good Higher Education Governance. And we will take evidence uh, from two panels this morning on these subjects. Uh, can I welcome to the committee uh, our first panel, uh, Professor Russell Griggs, OBE. Uh, good morning. Uh, you, sh you should, of course, be beside Professor, <laughs> Professor von Brunzinski, who uh, I am told is on his way shortly due to a uh, isn't here due to a delayed uh, train, so hopefully he'll be here in a few moments. But if you don't mind, uh, Professor Griggs, we'll just uh, kick off and hopefully Professor von Brunzinski will join you uh, very shortly. Um, uh, can I begin with a general question? You, you, you obviously wrote uh, your report uh, some time ago um, into further education, and I just wondered, uh, we now have the bill in front of us, we've gone through stage one, what your view is of the, uh, the process of taking your report and uh, where we are in terms of the bill that's before Parliament. Okay, <coughs> thank you, Chair. I'm delighted to. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm delighted to be here this morning um, to give evidence. I guess I would answer it in, 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 in a number of ways. When you sit down to do these reviews, um, it's a wonderful place to be because you can just start and you can think and you can say what you want in many ways. But anybody who's done these before also then then has to understand that they then at some point go back into the world of politics. Um, where um, different nuances and perhaps ways of doing things have to do. So I guess I was, I, I was asked the question recently of how I thought the bill was, and I think my answer would be it's okay. Um, like all these things, I don't think anybody who's ever written a review has ever had everything 100% taken from the review and transferred into legislation. So I think, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of the key areas around um, moving it towards a better structure, um, guided by a strategic forum with a bigger asset base for regions to build their education on, and I'm very satisfied with where it's gone. Um, surprising you'll be, you'll be um, maybe to hear that I would have done some of it quicker. I don't think some of it's gone as fast as it needed to do. Um, I think I probably would have been less flexible on some of the arrangements around um, coming together of colleges than perhaps I was. Uh, sorry, then it perhaps it's been, but I understand politically and other reasons why I didn't want to that. Um, why it's been, I still think we have a way to go on figuring out what we mean by outcomes. Um, I still think there's a lot of work for the funding council to get outcomes down to a simple thing. If I can give an example, if, if, if what you want to do is turn dirty water into clean water coming out of a pipe, then what you will go and test is the clean water, not what goes on in the pipe. And I think there's still an awful, an awful lot of testing what goes on in the pipe rather than looking at what the outcome is. So I think there's more work to be done there. And I do think that the um, strategic forum needs to start to focus now on some of the issues that I set out in my review around looking at where the, the college sector goes. Because I will go back to the, the point I made in the very last paragraph of the review that this can't be just something that says this is how it is and this is how it will be forever. This has got to be just to set a platform that everything else builds on. And therefore, I'm content that the legislation where it's got to has started to take that process forward. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Liz? Uh, Professor Griggs, could I just pick you up on the point that you're a bit concerned about some of the outcomes? Um, obviously, Post 16 is designed to deliver better outcomes. Uh, could you just give us a bit of detail as to what your concerns are? Yeah, I guess the, the, it's, it's about the length, the length of the outcomes. So to me, there's still far too much detail about the, the if you take the how the, an outcome as a what and, the, and then how you get there has to be in many ways run by the college or the college board that does it because there are many ways of getting for A to B and the point I made in my review was that what we have to do is give college boards the flexibility to have a short list of quite clear outcomes of what it is they're achieving but then not hide bound them by restrictions in that that doesn't allow them to be flexible, that they may have to be within their local community or within the type of student that they have. And in the work that the Funding Council's done to date, although the year two ones are better than the year one outcomes ones are, I still feel there's too much concentration, and it varies from one college having a two-page outcome agreement to others having very long ones. And I think it's, it's to do with the amount of detail they're still asking about in the middle around KPIs that are to do with the how rather than the what. 
Sorry, that, I'm just getting a bit confused there. I mean, uh, I'm not talking about outcome agreements. I was talking about the, the bill itself, because the outcome agreements are there in any case, irrespective of legislation. Could you be specific about how the bill could be improved? I'm, I'm fine with it, but like any bill, uh, and as you know, I spend a lot of my life worrying about what bills, how bills go into practice through regulation. So I'm happy with the bill in terms of outcomes. What I'm can still can have a concern about is how those outcomes will be taken into effect by the Funding Council, which are the, in the end are the people that have got to create the outcome. It's the outcome agreements that you're Correct. concerned about. Correct. Right. Correct. Um, could I just ask on another theme? Um, it was uh, put to us uh, by a couple of the principals of colleges when we took evidence that um, we're slightly envious of the university sector in having a new code of governance. Um, would it be uh, your opinion that that would be a good thing to have in the college sector too? I think that's something for the strategic forum to decide. I think one of the, I think one of the, hopefully my view on that strategic forum coming together, it will look at what it things needs to be common and what needs to be done as a sort of national standard across Scotland. Um, I wouldn't have any difficulties about it personally, um, but I think that's up for the strategic forum to sit down and think about if that's something that it wants. Just when you say that you know, the bill is okay, I mean. It that implication is that perhaps there could be certain things that would be better. Would you see that a code of governance would be something that would, would improve the college sector? I, I guess I would answer your question by saying it depends. It goes back to my point about outcomes. It depends how restrictive that code of conduct would be and whether that restriction was a sensible restriction or not. So I'm not trying to avoid the question. It depends how you write anything. Uh, if it was a code of conduct that gave people... Um, a guideline or, a, or a, a way of getting to what it is they want to do without saying here's how you will achieve it, then I think that would be okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, can, can I just interrupt proceeding slightly to welcome Professor Ron Brzezinski. I'm glad that the train got you here eventually. Uh, uh, thank you very much for coming along this morning. Um, Neil Finlay. Um, uh, okay is probably one of the more positive comments we've had on this bill uh, so far. Um, and some of the issues that have been raised, and I think we are likely to see a large number of amendments to the bill because uh, uh, of how it stands at the moment. A number of people um, have said that the bill should be delayed or, uh, or taken away and come back again. What would you, how would you comment on that? I, I think I'm, I'm, I made that in my opening remarks. I, I think in many ways there are bits of it that we're having to wait too long for. Um, if you take my own position for it, I'm, I'm retiring as chairman of Dumfries and Galloway College. Um, we cannot now go out and um, look for my replacement until the piece of legislation comes through. It's something that a number of other colleges will face. So I think we need, if, if we're going to move on to a, a new type of governance of college across Scotland, or, sorry, of FE across Scotland, then the sooner we move to it, the better. Um, because it does hold back things. I, 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 I think we've gone less quickly than I would have liked in some parts. So I, I, I did watch that evidence session, interestingly enough, and I'm not sure I would agree with the, with the argument that the person was Are you using. saying that we couldn't appoint someone under the existing rules? You could do, but, you're, but, you, well, you, but you would then only be appointing them up to the point can. of the legislation. And you would only be appointing them up to the point of the legislation. So you would have to, they, they would then the have case to go through any legislation, should well, yeah. Yes, but I mean, we're talking about now September or October, so you, you, you're sensibly telling me that I go out and employ a chair for two months to take this forward to September. Uh, you know, that's, that's the opinion that you're expressing. That some of us have expressed the opinion that we would rather see the bill delayed and get it right. Um, some, some of the um, uh, people given ev evidence, the EIS in particular, said that the complexity of the proposed structure will confound all but employees and public policy experts. And the Cabinet Secretary said that the structure was quite simple. Um, if you agree with the EIS's view, is that a problem in itself? And if you agree with the Cabinet Secretary's view, can you explain the structure in a very simple and quick way so that we can get our head around it? I mean, my structure was quite simple. We would move to 13 regional boards. Now, the Cabinet Secretary has chosen to um, for his own reasons, to make that more flexible and allow people to do, do, do things quite differently. I would hope over the coming years that we would see a, a, a bigger move towards a, a more regional structure. Every piece of evidence I have seen, both in this country and elsewhere, where colleges have come together in a bigger community, if I can put it that way, has shown benefit. I haven't seen one where it's shown disbenefit. 
Could I raise just one final point? We're starting to see the, the, the practical implications of what's happening in colleges at the moment, particularly in Edinburgh, where we're seeing the example that we've had several times at the committee is the closure, close of the uh, construction section in, in Midlothian. Um, is that a positive outcome for the students of that region? If the, if the board of the college has sat down and looked at how I use my assets properly to give the best education to the people within the area, and they've decided that they want to put the construction part of that in, in A rather than B, and that's the correct thing to do, then I have no issue with that. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thanks, Kavina. Um, Professor Greg, you, you touched uh, earlier on um, about the uh, approach taken in the bill. I think you used the... <coughs> Uh, the analogy of, of um, a, a, a pipe where you're trying to turn uh, dirty water into, into clean water. Do I take it from that your impression is that either through the ministerial powers or the powers um, uh, within the funding council that there is too much of an inclination within this bill to keep opening up the, the pipe and micromanage um, the process whereby whatever emerges at the, uh, at the end um, uh, accords with the, the kind of uh, objectives that are being set? I think I would go back before the bill to say that there's always been a, a concern within the college sector about the amount of information that the funding council and others collect and the reason for them collecting it. And it's never been clear to the college boards why the, why the funding council and others collect some of that information. So yes, I, the, I think I do agree that we're, we still do have concerns that we're being asked for stuff that doesn't... Um, really affect the what you know the outcome but is just a bit of micromanagement now i understand in essence why some of that has to happen because we all have to work within financial guidelines to do that but it's where it becomes not restrictive but it, it ends up we're using limited resource to do things that we nobody really sees the the, the the necessity for so i do still have concerns in that area yes now to be fair to the funding council i did say in my review that they would find this a big challenge as well moving towards an outcome base um, yeah, framework, because they are by, by their essence a, a, a bank and a data collection organisation. And I think they're just having um, a challenge in moving towards that as quickly as they would. Year two has been better than year one, but it still needs a bit of work. When you refer to the, the role of the Funding Council as a, a, as a bank and, and, and a, a data collection um, operation, um, I, yeah. There's a view that both with the FE and the HE sector, those funding levers are significant um, and, and that those are perhaps the best way of achieving the, the outcomes that, um, that, that we're seeking to achieve, as, to, as opposed to overlaying them then with specific uh, powers or responsibilities either uh, on ministers or, or on the funding council. Is that, is that something where we've got the balance right? Is it reflecting what your report was seeking to? As I, as I, just to be what I said, I think there's a way to go. I think the funding council are struggling is the wrong word, are, are, are moving towards to try to do that. But I think you can still see inconsistencies how that's done across Scotland in terms of the regional manager, the way they do it. And, and it is getting better, but in direct answer to your question, yes, I still think there's a way to go. And I still I, I think that has to be around focusing more on allowing boards to have the flexibility that they may need to adapt to the situation within their own geography that may make um, the learning outcome different, different than somebody else and how they get to that. So, I mean, that would, you would share the concern that you have set up a regional board that presumably is to take a strategic view over, over a region where the Funding Council appears to still retain um, some powers in relation to course provision across the region, which appears to be a duplication of, of effort in some respects. Isn't it? it does, and that's one of the things I think the Strategic Forum needs to sit down and sort out across Scotland to make sure that we have consistency in how that's done. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Professor von Brunzinski, I, I wonder if I could ask you about uh, your review. Clearly there's the draft code uh, which has now been published. Um, can you give us your view on uh, how well you think the draft code reflects the work that uh, your review group undertook? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Convener. I think, the <clears throat> I think there are a number of complex issues around this, one of which is what is a code of good, good governance actually for? What are we expected to do? Um, and maybe it's worth saying that what I don't think it is for it is as a substitute for legislation. So in other words, I didn't read the code and didn't look at it from the point of view of asking had it recommended 
all the particular points that the review of higher education governance that I chaired had put forward. Um, a code of good conduct is largely about ensuring that certain key principles of governance are upheld and, um, and sustained within uh, higher education institutions, and they're principles of integrity and transparency and le legitimacy and openness. Uh, and it's with that in mind that I would have looked at the code. I don't think it is yet perfect because I think there are some amendments that perhaps could be made to it and there is a process underway that allows people to, to make proposals for that. But, but on the whole, I think this, uh, this meets the objectives of a code of governance. I think it is good in, in terms that it's accessible. Uh, it's written in language that's likely to be easily applied. I think it, it uh, observes and maintains the main principles of good governance that I outlined. And so, um, and so I think it is, it, is not, it is not at all bad. I think it is, it's something well worth supporting. I know it's been criticized um, by some, including members of my uh, higher education governance panel. Uh, and, and I understand some of the criticisms that have been made, but on the whole, I think the issues that have been identified mostly at least, that have been identified as maybe not having been met in the code are probably issues for legislation anyway, rather than uh, for a code of good governance. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. Liz Smith. Uh, Professor von Prontinsky, um, as you say, it has been criticised quite heavily, <laughs> criticised in the sense that uh, they, they say uh, in their open letter that we cannot support uh, the proposed code in its current form, they put reasons uh, for that. Um, do you think uh, that that is a bit strong in its criticism? Well, as I say, I understand the particular issues which my colleagues on the panel have wanted to make. My own view is that the code could perhaps in certain relatively containable aspects be, be still amended, but, but with those amendments, I think, meets the objectives that such a code would have. So, in, in other words, um, as I understand it, the consultation period runs into June, um, and by the end of that time, you would envisage that it would be possible to make uh, the amendments uh, to the code that everybody would be happy? Well, of course, it depends. I mean, I'm not in charge of the code, and I can't say what amendments will be made after the consultation period is over. Uh, but I would say that the things that I might have identified, for example, as, as, as potentially improving the code, could easily be, uh, could easily be incorporated into it uh, without that changing the overall purpose and structure and, and, and purpose of the code. Uh, could I just ask in that context, then, would, would, in your view, would it have been uh, preferable had that timescale been completed by the time that we had got to uh, stage two? Well, I suppose it would be easier then to assess what the code in its final form actually contains, and we don't have that opportunity in quite that way now. Uh, so, I, in some ways, the answer to your question is yes, but, you know, we're here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Can I just uh, briefly just hopefully clear something up? I mean, could you tell the committee, if the Scottish the draft code becomes the, the Scottish code in future in, in some form, what happens to the UK code? Um, what is the status of the UK code post the implementation of the Scottish code? Because they don't exactly overlap point for point. No, they don't overlap. And in fact, in, in fairness, it has to be said that the draft code that's in front of us now goes further than the uh, code that was adopted uh, by the Committee of University Chairs. Uh, that latter code uh, is a voluntary code in the sense that it, it was put forward by the um, university chairs across the UK. It is expected of universities that they would abide by it, but there is no framework in which universities can be compelled to do so. Um, we, don't, uh, we don't yet quite know how this uh, will uh, play in Scotland, but I'm assuming, particularly in the light of the post-16 bill, uh, that there will be a statutory framework under which at least a comply or explain provision, which is also contained within the draft code, would apply to Scottish universities. So in other words, the status of the Scottish code will be greater than or more effective than the existing UK-wide code. Just for clarity. Sorry, I didn't answer the, the, the question you asked. The, uh, the, the UK code, I would regard in those, uh, in those circumstances having been superseded by the Scottish code and no longer applying to Scotland. None of it at all? No. Okay, thank you. Neil Finlay? Um, <coughs> yeah, in the, the letter that we received from three of the five members of your uh, uh, committee, it says the Chair and we three were in agreement on all, uh, all the proposed measures and in particular that they should be taken as a whole package if they are, are to have the greatest possible effect in making Scottish higher education more tra transparent, democratic and publicly 
accountable. So three out of five are saying that, given that you wrote the report, I'm assuming that's four out of five are saying that. Um, um, would the report, uh, if taken as a whole and implemented, make Scottish universities more democratic, accountable and transparent than what has been proposed in the Code of Governance? Well, as I said a moment ago, I think the, the report that we issued last year cannot be completely implemented by a code of good governance, no matter what is in that code, because there are recommendations that we made in the higher, higher education governance review which can only be implemented by legislation. They couldn't be implemented by code. Um, and to that extent, uh, I think the complete implementation of the code will require legislation. By that, I mean legislation beyond the post-16 bill that's, that's there now. Uh, the government has indicated, as I understand it, that, uh, that they do intend to uh, bring forward legislation on higher education governance more generally uh, at some point during, in the present parliament. And I would expect that to be necessary in order to fully implement the, the recommendations of the governance review. It, again, referring to the letter, it says that the, uh, the, the, the code ignores many of the recommendations of the von Prinsinski report. Uh, that it, should, it could have addressed and actively countermands others. Would you agree with that? It, well, it does not contain uh, some of the recommendations that we made, but as I said a moment ago, I don't think it could contain all of them uh, because it's, uh, it would require legislation in, in some of those instances. As for countermanding, I mean, I think there is clearly, a, for example, there is a, there is a framework in the code uh, for the appointment of chairs of governing bodies, which is not in line with the recommendation made in the Higher Education Governance Review. It is, however, one of those uh, recommendations that we made that I think actually requires legislation. I don't think, in all fairness to the, uh, to, to the group that drafted the code, I don't think they could have made that recommendation in the code. It would have been too difficult to implement by that route. So if that's going to be implemented, we require legislation. Uh, I think... Therefore, I think the, we all need to be aware of the fact that this is just one part of a process, that the code, it's a very important part because we actually recommended as in our review that there should be a code of good governance for higher education, and therefore th th this is uh, in, at least potentially an implementation of that recommendation, um, but it can't, that cannot complete the picture. And therefore, I would prefer to say that one ought to look at the code in terms of whether what it contains improves the position in terms of governance, meaning in terms of integrity and transparency and openness, um, and maybe not get too hung up on whether all of the recommendations of the Higher, higher Education Governance Review are contained in it. I, as, as I said, I'm still of the view that that will require legislation. Um, was it a mistake for the university chairs to decide to set up their own group to review the code without any uh, representation from students and from employees within the sector or trade unions? Uh, as I understand it, the, uh, the process was that the chairs made an offer to run with the process of drafting a code and that there were subsequent discussions between the chairs and the cabinet. That was a mistake that they went down? Well, there were subsequent discussions between the chairs and the, the cabinet secretary uh, and the process that, that ensued I would uh, imagine was the, was, the, uh, was the result of that. It's difficult for me to answer your question because clearly I've been in favour, and that's been reflected in the Higher Education Governance Review and other statements that I've made, I've been in favour of, of an inclusive approach to the management of this agenda. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have a draft code, and I think we need to look at it now in terms of what's in it, in terms of how appropriate it is for that. Just one final point. Is it... Is it the law or politics that is your specialism? My academic specialism? Yes. I was a lawyer. It doesn't surprise me with the answers that we've received today, I'm afraid. Liz Smith. Professor von Prasinski, could, could I just ask, when you were at committee uh, way back some time ago, uh, you said, uh, I think it was uh, the phrase that there was nothing radically wrong uh, with governance in Scottish universities. I think um, most of the committee members at that time agreed with that point. What is it that you feel um, is not good about governance now that is not only requiring a new updated code but also uh, further legislation to come because that's not something that you indicated to the committee before. 
Uh, well, the, the review that we, that we submitted last year is quite clear on that particular point, that, that we, in fact, we recommended both a higher education statute and, um, and a code of good governance, and, and, and that's been certainly my position throughout, and, and I apologise if I was ever ambivalent about that because I didn't intend to be. Um, I think the, uh, you're absolutely right in, the, in, in quoting me that I believe that Scottish universities uh, on the whole have conducted themselves extremely well and indeed are very successful institutions in the global higher education system and I don't think that's really a matter for, uh, for dispute at all. Um, but in terms of governance and, re and related matters, it is important that there should be a high degree of public trust and confidence. So it's not just a question that you know, that I could say, put my hand on my heart and say that my university uh, applies the highest standards of governance if that is not clearly visible and is not accepted with confidence by those who observe what we do. Um, it, it was clear to us when we were conducting uh, our research and listening to evidence before we produced our report that there were large sections of uh, stakeholder bodies with an interest in higher education who were not satisfied uh, that there was definitely good practice being applied in, in higher education. And while we might not have concluded, didn't in fact conclude, that there was a serious fundamental problem, um, we did nevertheless take the view, and I still take the view now, uh, that it is important that there should be a high level of confidence, public confidence, and that that needs to be expressed in, um, in transparency and openness of procedures, and that therefore the recommendations that we made will help the university sector gain that sense of confidence. Okay, th thank you for putting it on the record about uh, the concerns that were raised. C could you provide us with some evidence uh, that was given to you that the current uh, code, uh, current governance arrangements in Scottish universities don't deliver as good an education as they should? Uh, well, I think for, for a start, obviously, um, we looked at a number of, di of different uh, submissions and we heard a number of people who, uh, who gave evidence to us. I don't think the substance of that evidence was that there was something deficient in Scottish higher education in, uh, in terms of provision of education, and equally it needs to be said that that wasn't really our remit anyway, uh, but rather that there, that there was a suspicion on occasion uh, that the way in which universities operated excluded uh, parts of the university body uh, or that significant parts of the higher education community either did not have access to decision making or didn't understand how it was made uh, or that stakeholders, external stakeholders sometimes were in that position. Um, and the evidence that we received on this is, on, is public, so, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it can be read. Uh, we did not make a judgment on whether those uh, particular comments were objectively justified. We just noted that there were views of that kind being expressed. And once that is the case, it is important that we have a system under which uh, integrity and transparency are seen to be done, not just that you can say that it is done, but that it is visible uh, and that the public can have confidence in that. I, I totally accept that um, in, in terms of uh, the accountability and the transparency, I think that's absolutely essential. What I'm driving at is that if we are to improve that, obviously one of the key issues is about whether that actually delivers a better university sector, and I'm not clear that there's terribly much evidence about that. Well, I think that is really an issue that isn't, that isn't specific to universities. I mean, it is like saying, should there be high standards of corporate governance in the corporate world? You know, but this is, I think it's something that we generally as a, as a society have accepted, that there needs to be a high level of accountability and appropriate conduct of integrity. And that, that needs to be the case, whether you can prove that there is a, an impact on performance or not. Um, and uh, because apart from anything else, there is always the risk that, a, uh, that defective integrity and transparency will at some point in the future produce a problem. Would you accept, though, that if we are being asked to let a decision about whether to legislate or not, that is a key part for us because it is perfectly possible to have that transparency and accountability without necessarily legislating. That, that's a decision that this committee has got to take. Do we need to legislate to get that accountability and transparency or do we actually have a situation which uh, can be worked through the existing code and updated code that would provide that uh, outcome? Well, we made a number, we made 40 odd recommendations in our report. If 
all I can say is if you were to accept, or if anybody were to accept, that those are good recommendations, some of them will require legislation. They can't be implemented in any other way. Thank you. Liam MacArthur. Convener, um, the, I think following on from uh, Liz Smith's questions, where uh, we have received evidence suggesting that um, uh, the international comparisons suggest that the uh, the responsible autonomy model is, is one that does generally deliver better results. I think it's the Shanghai table that was uh, refer, referred to uh, uh, as evidence for that. Given that there are concerns in the sector that um, the, the, the move towards legislating a number of these areas will inevitably undermine that um, responsible autonomy, how would you how would you square with that? Given your own role within the sector, and presumably you have a, a horse in this race. Uh, well, in the review of higher education governance report that we issued, we actually agreed with that and we, uh, we reinforced that particular point that an autonomous system of higher education with autonomous institutions is a very important ingredient in a successful sector. Uh, and there is nothing, certainly from my perspective, there is nothing that we recommended or that certainly I would have wanted to recommend that would run counter to that. Um, and as you say, there are global rankings, there's lots of other evidence to suggest that those institutions in those systems that have a high level of autonomy perform best. Uh, that does not mean to say, however, that the public should take no interest in how institutions perform uh, and that there are clearly issues of integrity uh, and, and proper conduct that need to be maintained in, even within an autonomous system. Uh, and that, as I was saying a moment ago, is, is not specific to higher education. We, we, we think that of the corporate sector, we think that of banking, we think of, of, of all sorts of other, which are autonomous uh, sectors within the economy, but which nevertheless clearly need to apply high standards of, of good conduct. Uh, and, and that is really the same in higher education and universities. So the recommendations that we made were not calculated to overturn the idea of institutional autonomy, and in particular institutional autonomy as regards strategic direction uh, and, and conduct, but rather that we should ensure that institutions uh, conduct their business in such a ma manner that they are seen to be behaving with highest ethical uh, standards and that that is visible to all the stakeholder bodies. You, I, I absolutely um, concur with that. But would you not um, accept that because there's an argument for suggesting that an updated code and, and, and perhaps an updated code that is further improved before it's finally settled on um, later in the summer, along with the funding levers that the, the Funding Council has at its disposal, are sufficient in, their, in order to, to deliver what it is that I think we're all seeking, uh, which is a, a sector that is transparent and accountable, um, but is, uh, has the responsible autonomy uh, to deliver not just in a national context, but in an international context. Well, I think it's, a, it, it, as in all these things, it is a matter of finding the right mix. I think those things that can adequately be contained within a code should be contained within it and not legislation, and that is why we recommend it, that there should be a code of good governance, and there are a number of our recommendations uh, which uh, most appropriately would be contained within that. Um, but in higher education, again, as in other sectors, you, you, there is a need for some legislative grounding. There is legislation now. It's not what we're, rec we're recommending that, that, that legislation should be introduced as a complete innovation with, with, within the system. In fact, one of the reasons why we recommended that there should be a higher education act is because the, the legislation currently is complex, uh, and there are a number of different statutes, some of them hard to understand that apply to different institutions and we think some simplification of that would actually help the sector uh, but legislation at some level is necessary and you know and it just as we wouldn't say uh, that banking or, or corporate affairs can be handled just by codes of, of, of uh, good governance and good practice but some legislation is necessary to underpin uh, society's expectations of how these sectors operate and that's no different in higher education we, we were not recommending and I'm not recommending now that this should be in, intrusive or that it should uh, undermine autonomy or uh, flexibility of action by institutions. Clearly, those are the kind of standards you also apply in assessing any legislation that comes forward. Thank you. Can I welcome uh, to the committee this morning Jenny Mara, who's joined us uh, briefly. Uh, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Thank you, convener. Thank you for allowing me. And I apologise to the clerks and, and uh, colleagues for not giving prior notice. But I wanted to put a question to Professor um, von Prudinsky. It's regarding your... Um, governance review and your recommendation on gender quotas for university governing boards. Can I ask you why you made that recommendation in your report? 
Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, we made that recommendation because, uh, should we say, practice within the sector is pretty uneven. There are some universities that perform better than others in terms of, uh, of gender balance and diversity on governing bodies. Um, but there are some universities, I, I, and I won't name them here, but there are some universities where it could be an awful lot better uh, than what it is. Uh, I myself came from a system before I came to Aberdeen in Ireland where there was a statutory obligation to have a 40% gender balance in governing bodies. Uh, and uh, I have taken the view that that worked well. Uh, I think that it is important, again, as part of, uh, of gaining the confidence of the wider society that universities show that the composition of their governing bodies reflects society more generally. Uh, and clearly we're not doing that if there are few or occasionally even no women who are, who are on such, uh, such governing bodies. So I would stand by the recommendation that we made. I think it's a good one. I should add, however, that that is one of those that you really couldn't introduce by, or not easily at least, by a code. I think that probably does require legislation. Not least because if it were just in a code, it would be open to legal challenge, and I think that would need to be dealt with by legislation first. How easy would it be to legislate for? I'm not sure whether that's a legal or a political question. So, but if uh, uh, it, look, looking at it legally, it, it would uh, it would be it would be possible to, uh, certainly to to do so. Uh, and and there are uh, there are ex illustrations of how this has been done in in other parts and other sectors. And one final point on that, convener. You said um, about the gender balance um, on the governing board to reflect and. For, for wider society to see it. Can you tell me a bit about the impact that a better gender balance on the governing body would have on the institution itself? Well, one of the things, of course, is that, that uh, and we were looking at this, that occasionally there is a risk not just of gender imbalance or lack of diversity on governing bodies, but that actually, e even outside of that, that the particular range of skills and expertise available to governing bodies based on membership uh, is limited and is limited to particular, very often typically to particular aspects of economic activity. Um, <clears throat> if a greater diversity, including, including gender balance, were to be introduced and, and successfully implemented in governing bodies, that range would be significantly widened and therefore as a result the expertise and advice available to the governing body would be much more balanced. Thank you. Yes, convener. Uh, I can only concur with both Ms. Mara and yourself in, in terms of uh, gender balance and it being a good thing, but I just wondered in terms of your legal background, it strikes me that equality legislation is reserved to Westminster. So if, if there was an attempt by this Parliament to legislate along those lines, would it not be ultra vires? Uh, well, that would depend on, the, on how the uh, particular provision w were framed. Um, clearly, if, for example, if there were legislation that were introduced that indicated that a, we, in particular positions on a governing body that a gender-based decision would have to be made, then, then that would be a problem, and, and I suspect that wouldn't succeed. Um, if, however, a, 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 this is how it was in the system that I came from, if a statutory obligation were placed on governing bodies to maintain an overall gender balance, not specific to any particular appointment to the uh, governing body, then, then my advice would be that that should be in line with, uh, with the legal framework. Thanks very much. Neil Finlay. Um, just, just on that issue, the, the, uh, the group set up to review the code has seven members and two advisors, um, only one of them as a woman, do you think we have a real challenge in getting the message across to these people? Essentially, yes. We did. It's, I should say that the panel uh, that I chaired, we were very aware of this particular issue uh, during our deliberations. And, uh, and we were aware of the fact that, that we were an all-male group, and that, that was not ideal. Thank you, Vera. One of the recurrent themes throughout uh, your report, Professor von Prudzinski, is uh, in relation to representation from students and from staff, and yet the draft code seems to have watered that down considerably. Do you, is, is this one of the areas that you would see legislation was required? I, would, I wouldn't have thought so, but... Uh, no, I think actually area? in this particular case, uh, it would be my view that the code could usefully be amended. 
and, uh, and I agree with the point that's in, uh, implied in your question. I think the, with the recommendation we made in our review was that remuneration committees, nomination committees and, and, uh, and bodies of that kind should contain staff and student representatives. That is my view, it remains my view, and I think the, it would be helpful if the Code also stated that. So the Code could reflect that without any legislation? I believe so. Oh, yes, the Code could easily. Yeah. Yes. In terms of your recommendations and amendments to the code, I think you mentioned earlier it was not yet perfect. Um, and that's one example of where you would like to see changes. Um, are there, what other areas are there that you would like to see amended that, that, that fall short of your recommendations? For example, meetings in public, role of students, number, um, you know, examples of consultation with staff and students. Um, references to ab abolition or transparency of bonuses or detail on how staff and students um, I think they, uh, some of those issues different. I think probably don't fall under the code so for example um, remuneration and bonuses and things like that I think will have to be handled as I'm not actually sure that requires legislation but but I'm not sure that that's an issue for the code uh, I think there are um, the, the the main issue that I would identify with the code is the one that I've just mentioned. And I think that the uh, that the that staff and student representation on decision-making bodies of that kind, particularly those that are uh, relevant to appointments uh, and remuneration, uh, and it should be uh, should be provided for. And I think the code should ideally say that. Uh, the other, th the other points that I would have identified are m more minor and technical in nature, and I don't, I don't actually have them in front of me in any case, I, so, so I'm not in a position to go through them in detail. Um, but I think, the, uh, for me, the one that we've just mentioned is the, if you like, a sort of a more fundamental one. The others are, are more technical in nature. The, the code has been described as being written by managers for managers, and obviously um, there are views that students and staff should be um, much more involved in, in, the, in the governance and the, uh, arrangements. Um, uh, you know, obviously this has been drafted by um, the, the chairs of, of university courts. Um, what expectation do you have that this will be amended? You say it should be. Do you, do you expect it to be amended? Uh, well, for a side, it wasn't actually drafted. It was drafted under the direction of university chairs, but it wasn't drafted by them. And, and indeed, the, uh, and you'll have other opportunities to, to, to explore that, but, but, uh, but I know that the uh, chairs had no direct input into the drafting of the code. There was a, a working group set, a steering group set up for that, which had uh, representation uh, going well beyond the, 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 the chairs. Uh, so in that sense, I do not think that the code was drafted by managers for managers, not least because actually chairs aren't managers either. You know, I am, but, but, but chairs are not. Um, and so in, in, in that sense, I think it's, uh, it's a comment, I can understand politically why it was made, but, but probably isn't a, isn't a fair one. Uh, the, the code reflects, uh, for me, two things, one of which is to, to have a higher level of, of accountability and transparency and predictability in systems, and it is presented in a way that is accessible. Uh, and I think that's an important element, it, and I think it is, in that sense, better than any other code that I'm aware of, uh, some of which are quite uh, opaque in, in, in the way in which they're written. Uh, so I think it doesn't particularly reflect the the defects that you've outlined, um, which is not to say that there is nothing that can be improved. And I think the, the steering group that presided over the drafting of the code was of that view itself, because after all, it has opened it up to consultation to, and to submissions. Do you stand by all your recommendations in the report? In the higher education yeah. review report? Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. There is, well, I, there's one proper, perhaps, why I personally have been... Uh, persuaded that it might not be uh, it might not be ideal. It was the only one, and and, it, and I'm mentioning it because it is relevant to 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 the code and to uh, recommendations made in it. Um, and this is that we, we recommended, and at the time I was strongly of the view that was correct, that meetings of governing bodies should be in public. Uh, I still think that that's an ideal scenario that I would like to see, would have would like to see. Uh, but I understand some of the points that have been made to me by uh, people in response to that, which is that if 
they, if such meetings were in public, the willingness of members of the governing body to be critical of the university management would probably be compromised. That if they were doing this in public, they mightn't want to do it. Uh, and that therefore, it's an element of monitoring and control might disappear uh, as a result of that. I have been persuaded that that is an argument that might carry some weight. But apart from that, I stand by everything that we said in the review. You can see why there would be concerns about that, meetings behind closed doors. And yeah, I think, um, I think it is very important that meetings should have the highest level of openness and transparency that's possible. That, for example, means that the agenda of any meeting should be publicly available before the meeting, uh, so that people know what's going to be discussed. That there should be a, a proper open publication of documents and of minutes. Uh, and that there should be opportunities for people outside of governing bodies who are aware of what's going to be discussed to, if, for example, make submissions so that there can be inputs made. And, I'm, I'm, and the highest level of, of openness and transparency that's possible is always good. I would ideally like meetings in public if I hadn't, um, if I were not persuaded by the argument that that might sh uh, shut down some of the discussion, I would still prefer that. But, but, I have, uh, but shall we say that, that those who have made that, that point to me have made it with some, shall we say, with some force that I understand. I think um, you've given a very skillful and lawyerly performance uh, this morning. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> take it as you will. Um, but I find it difficult to see how you can stand by your report, but also say that you support the code that's developed because it dismisses so much of what you had in your report. I just find that difficult to follow. Well, would you give me an example of something that the code dismisses that was in our report? Well, we've only got a few minutes. I could give you a list. I mean, my colleague Neil Bibby gave you a number of things that were, uh, that were there uh, in terms of representation, in terms of you know, the, uh, the uh, gender issue, meetings in public. I know we could go on and on and on. They're all there. Yes, but I say, the, all the examples you've given, the one example you gave, I've, I'm, I've agreed with, and, and I think there should be a change. The others you've given so far are really all for legislation. They wouldn't be for the government. refer you to the letter from the three, mm. three of the five members of, uh, of your uh, group, because they cover uh, the, the, the points made. So, uh, you know, if, is there no contradiction between standing by your report and then supporting the code yeah, that's I, I think. I think the... Um, I think there are a number of issues that will require legislation, as I've said, I, I think, and I remain in favour of that. I think that that will need to be done. I believe the government intends to do it. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, I do not believe that there is a contradiction between uh, my support of the, of the review that I chaired and the code, bearing in mind that I do say that some adjustments to the code would be desirable. Uh, I think the, uh, it was never my expectation that the code would, as it were, implement the Higher Education Governance Review. That's not really what a code of good governance is supposed to do. Um, but, that it would, but that it would, within the spirit of, the, of that review, uh, introduce a framework of, of good practice uh, in governance. With some, as I say, specific uh, points that, I, that, that are open to amendment, I'd say that the code, in, on the whole, does that. Do you think there's any merit in delaying the bill? I think the uh, staying with this particular point with that's relevant to the bill, I think in relation to what the bill says about, um, about good governance, uh, principles of good governance, it is important that it should be known what those principles are before the bill becomes law. In other words, there, should, there shouldn't be an ambiguity about which principles of good governance the act, if it became an act, uh, supports. If through the um, process of finalising the code that we're involved in, we get a code that has been adopted, and that by which I mean that the government has accepted as appropriate, and that ultimately I think is a decision for government, uh, and if therefore it is clear which principles are therefore being referred to in the bill, then I think that timing issue is no longer significant. If, on the other hand, we don't know what the, what the bill is actually referring to as principles of good governance, then, then it might be more of an issue. Can I just clarify on that point? If the um, bill status isn't talked about 
the code, and uh, the code was the current UK code, would that cause any problems? Uh, well, what the bill currently says is um, the, require the institution to, to comply with any principles of governance or management which appear to the Scottish ministers to constitute good practice. And I suppose the question that that raises is what are those principles of, uh, uh, of governance or management? Um, and that, so my point really is that, that that needs to be clarified as to what that's a reference to, and that needs to be clarified within the, the bill rather than uh, with any accompanying commentary. Uh, I, if, there, if that were a reference to the CUC code, not entirely sure that I would regard that necessarily as the most appropriate thing, given that we've said that there should be a specific Scottish code, because the Scottish system of higher education is now significantly different from the English system, and I think it would be appropriate that there should be specific guidelines and good, of good governance for Scotland, which is why we made that recommendation in the review. So I think there is an ambiguity about that particular section which probably needs to be sorted. John? Yes, I'll just come in on a particularly distinctive aspect of, of Scottish higher education, which was, is the election of rectors by the student body to, to chair the court. Now, in the written submission from the University and College Union, they suggest that the new draft of the code actually dilutes the important role of rector as the elected chair of the governing body, and I wondered if you shared those concerns? My reading of the code, and I might need to do that again, my reading of the code didn't lead me to that conclusion. That, that it, the code, if I recall, does actually recognise the, the role of rectors in, uh, as having the right to chair uh, governing bodies within those universities that have rectors. Uh, I believe that this system should... I mean, we've recommended in the, in the uh, higher education governance reviews, you know, uh, that chairs of governing bodies should be elected. I stand by that, incidentally. I think that is the, that is the correct way forward. Uh, although I am also of the view that that cannot be implemented in a code of uh, governance. That really does require legislation to, to, to implement. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, shall we say, I think within the system that exists at the moment and uh, recognising that that isn't at the, the, the system at the moment, what the code says is, 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 not, is not bad. The, the problem at the moment is that not just do we not have um, in a majority of the institutions elected chairs of governing bodies, we also have processes for appointing chairs which are, shall we say, occasionally quite opaque. Uh, where it's difficult to see exactly how this is done and, and the extent to which there are open processes involved. Uh, the evidence is that overwhelmingly chairs come from within the existing, uh, with the existing governing body as distinct from there being an, an, an external in, input into that. Uh, and, uh, and the recommendations made in the code assuming for a moment that we are not or not yet in a, in a situation where chairs are elected under a statutory regime, uh, is an improvement uh, on the position that exists at the moment. So, uh, so I wouldn't be quite so critical of that, but, but this doesn't, however, change my view that the recommendation that we made in the r report we submitted last year to have elected chairs is the correct one. So it's an improvement, but not enough of it is not. It is not, for me, the end of the road, no. no. Uh, can I thank the witnesses both very much for coming along this morning? We appreciate very much your time in, in coming this morning to the committee. And, and can I suspend briefly? <coughs>
Um, our next panel uh, this morning is it's still on the uh, uh, post-16 uh, bill, but particularly on the draft Scottish Code of Good Higher Education and Governance. And can I welcome to the committee this morning uh, Robin Parker, President of NUS Scotland, uh, Mary Senior, Scottish Official University and College Union Scotland, uh, Lord Robert Smith of Kelvin, uh, Chair, and Simon Pepper, Committee Member of the Steering Group on the Scottish Code for Good Higher Education. Uh, and can I, again, can I thank you all for coming along this morning uh, to give evidence to the committee. Uh, Lord Smith, perhaps I could uh, begin with you in asking for uh, you to outline the process which you undertook in, in, in taking the, uh, some of the features uh, we had this morning from uh, Professor von Brunzinski uh, and others in terms of bringing forward the new draft code. I took the von Brunzinski code, uh, the, his report on higher education, and then we employed two consultants to go out and consult with people in universities. We visited every higher education institution. We saw 360 people over 80 meetings. We split it into management, uh, to principals and, and so on, to uh, unions, to staff, to uh, students. So we had individual meetings, and I think they're all listed in the back of a report here. At the end of that, we sifted that evidence, and we had four meetings, and we arrived at our conclusion, which I think faithfully represents the evidence we had gathered. Can I just, very briefly, before we go into some of the detail, take you back to that consultation process? Because clearly, the committee did hear um, both an oral evidence earlier in the year and in written evidence for this committee meeting. Um, some criticisms of the the process which was undertaken. Um, um, certainly a number of witnesses stated that they felt that they hadn't been properly consulted, that the meetings were short and shallow, um, and really did not give them the opportunity to properly input into the process. I mean, how do you respond to those criticisms? Well, I, I, I largely reject the thing. I think there were 80 meetings over a period of four or five months, so that's an awful lot to pack in. They were seeing people in different groups at each university, so we probably had anything between half an hour to an hour, depending on how many people they were seeing. Uh, so there were several hours spent at each university. Uh, it's quite a commitment for the, for the people who were undertaking that. I don't think we could have done much more. I think uh, we did not see unions as a, as a group, as a, as a body, as a steering group. To see them, we'd have had to have seen principals, we'd have had to have seen chairs of court, we'd have had to have seen a whole lot of other people. So we did that through the consultants, uh, and we sifted their evidence very carefully. They were challenged on it by Elish, by Simon, by me, as well as the three chairs of court who were there. So I actually think, you know, if people are saying they were badly treated at the time, I don't have evidence of that. I've got the reports of all the meetings that took place, and we sifted through them very, very carefully. Uh, but we did actually go out and consult widely. Mary, uh, sorry, Mary Senior, can I ask how you respond to that? Because clearly some of the criticisms came from um, union members uh, and, uh, and staff members in universities. Um, yeah, thank you, convenient. I mean, I guess, yes, I did when I gave evidence on the, uh, in, in February. Um, we did express our concerns about this whole process. Um, I said before that meetings were fairly short and that they weren't minuted. Um, and I also expressed concerns that um, when trade unionists were actually invited to give evidence, they were giving evidence along with um, other um, groups um, of individuals. So it, it wasn't just a, a meeting um, of, um, of trade unionists to, to be able to express a point from a staff perspective. Um, and I think those concerns have been borne out in terms of the uh, draft code that we see um, in front of us because, um, as our written evidence explains, um, the University and College Union is, is very concerned um, with the draft code in that it, it doesn't truly reflect um, certainly uh, many of the recommendations that were in the von Prondinsky um, report, which was um, a more inclusive process, um, and it doesn't reflect uh, many of the concerns that UCU certainly um, provided to um, the consultants that um, met with us. Do you accept the evidence we received this morning um, from Professor von Brunzinski that uh, he, he did not expect all of those recommendations to be in the code and neither they should be and some in fact should be in legislation? 
But I think there's many of the recommendations that are in the von Prondinsky report which could be um, encompassed in the, um, the, the, the draft code that, that's here. Um, I mean, it was very interesting to hear his observations on the recommendation about meeting in public. Um, you know, I think that was a really important um, recommendation from von Prundinsky's report. Um, it really embodies uh, openness and transparency. Um, and I actually do think it uh, makes uh, board members or court members more accountable. And it also ensures that the officials or uh, managers who are bringing recommendations um, have thoroughly tested uh, what they're actually proposing uh, when they bring it to um, a meeting. I think meetings in public um, don't prevent difficult decisions being taken. It just ensures that difficult decisions are taken in a more... Um, inclusive and transparent way and, and certainly trade unions know that um, governing bodies have to take difficult decisions uh, but I do think if we've, if we've been able to test um, those decisions and, and, and have taken uh, views um, from staff and students um, we actually get to a better place um, you know, for, for the institution in question. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Mr Smith, the um, as Chair, did you express concerns about the lack of uh, women, about the lack of students and the lack of um, employer and trade union representation on your group? I took what I was given. Uh, sometimes that's not a great thing, but I was given one woman, three independents, including me, and three chairs of court. That, that's the team I was given to play with. Yeah. What refused it's to say. It's obvious to everybody else that there was, a, you know, people lacking on that group, surely have dawned well, that, on that's those... A different, that's well, a different question. Well, in, in uh, bit, so no, it is a different a question because the, the people lacking, we had no principal on the group, as there was in, on the, the earlier uh, higher education uh, report. Therefore, we had no unions in the group. Uh, we had no students in the group, but there had been students there before. We had uh, Ferdinand come along and actually present to our meeting in Glasgow at length we spent about an hour and a half with them. So, and he was chairing that group, and he was standing by the recommendations he had made. So, I, you know, sure, I could have turned around and said, "You've given me an inferior team here. There are th people missing." But we at least had one woman, and by the way, she gave a very good account of herself. I don't know if you know her, but she's a redoubtable lady. Uh, so, we certainly had plenty of input there. And it's not impossible for independents to actually understand things like women representation. A lot of the things we pushed uh, in, in the draft report that we, we brought out is more student representation, more female representation, and I would be very disappointed if this code did not lead to a lot more of that uh, when people actually work out their plans and build their goals into their future plans. Given that what you've said there about who, who was missing, then the UCU have said that uh, we stated that the code development process was flawed from the start and has resulted in a faulty draft code. You kind of are inferring there that you might agree with some of that, given that we had one well, if you let me finish, if, given, if, excuse me, if you let me finish, given that what you were, you were given, you have expressed concerns here about what you were given, therefore would it not have been better to have a group developing the code that was more inclusive that brought on more people who were stakeholders in the process rather than what you were given? First of all, I did not say I was not satisfied with what I had given. You're asking me should I have turned around and said, I did not. I was given a team. I think the team was a good team. We went out and we consulted in a very, very detailed way. 360 people were asked questions in every single institution and they came back with that evidence and there were enough of us with completely independent minds to sift through that evidence. And I actually think what we're brought out is a very progressive code. Hey, thanks. Simon, oh, Andrew. Simon, yeah, yeah, yes, please. Yes. Add to that. As, as an independent <laughs> member, um, also, uh, I'd just like to kind of reassure you that um, I don't think that the membership of the steering group represents any kind of bias. In, in fact, um, in trying to, I was invited to participate and I accepted the invitation. Um, and the logic that I understood lay behind the composition of the group was that it needed to comprise some 
uh, chairs of universities because they are going to be taking the responsibility for uh, the implementation of the code and it's important that they should and they have no sectional interest their interest is in general good governance of the universities and the independents who have no conflict of interest uh, to have included any representatives of sectional interests on the steering group would ironically have been a, a breach of the principles of good governance which we are supposed to be promoting. So I think if you look at it in that way, it's a fair composition and I can reassure you that I don't think, well, if there was ever any of us who might be guilty of a bias, I suppose that I would be the um, candidate for that because my background is as a, as a rector elected by students and I, when I was a rector, was certainly a strong champion for the interests of students. But I don't think anybody's going to be... Um, criticizing me for having exercised that as a, as a prejudice in these, in these uh, proceedings. So I'd just like to reassure you a bit about the composition, because it has more rationale to it than maybe meets the eye. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Colin Beatty. Thank you, Vera. Um, in drawing up this code, uh, you took into account uh, both Professor von Pranzinski's review and uh, the UK code. Now, the implication being, of course, that uh, you take the best from, from both in order to create this, uh, this new code. And yet, specifically, there's a number of issues that, in Professor von Prasinski's review that uh, you don't seem to have ad addressed. For example, um, the uh, inclusion of uh, student representatives and staff representatives, which von Prasinski, you may have heard his evidence earlier on, felt very strongly about, but that seems to have been com practically completely watered down and taken out. Was it, what was the reason for that? I, I think, just to, to be clear, you're saying that we said there were to be no student and staff representatives where? I, that. I said that uh, it had been watered down, I, what, I do, what was proposed yes, I, by Professor von Pranzinski. I don't believe that to be true. I actually think this is a very progressive code. We've asked people to produce goals. We have said it specifically that nominations committee must include a student representative and a staff representative must include and we have said that when deciding on appointing chairs of court principals and when appraising a principal that students and staff must be taken into account now that's a far move from where we are today and i would expect on things like female male balance on the board I really would hope there's serious aspirational levels in that, that people actually come up with decent percentages which they then deliver on. And if they do not, the Scottish Funding Council and the Court of Public Opinion and peer pressure and people living in a community will see that these universities are not complying. When you were taking into account the UK code, did you take any advice as to what the status of the UK code would be versus the Scottish code, particularly where they have, they have uh, uh, issues which are not carried forward into the Scottish code? Simon, are you, if I could interrupt you. Um, I, uh, I don't think that, uh, we, we, weren't, we didn't have our attention drawn to that particular issue, but our understanding, I think, is that uh, the Scottish code proposed doesn't go back on any commitments that are in, this, in the UK code. Indeed, we've identified a dozen or so examples where our code is a progression on, uh, as compared with the UK, the UK code. So if there are issues where there appears to be some kind of gap, uh, in, in, and with, with the CUC code imposing more stringent requirements than we have, I think we would like to know about that and, and to reflect on it. Well, I think the UK code uh, covers one or two things that are not actually explicitly covered in the Scottish code. For example, estate management, students' union, health and safety and such like. Right. Well, um, that wasn't drawn to our attention and we would need to reflect on that if that's the, if, if that's the case, if there's a gap there. And perhaps that was what was behind the, the convener's question earlier about the uh, relations between these two to the professor earlier. Can, can I just um, take you back a moment uh, to the point about the involvement of staff and students? Um, professor Ron Brunzinski recommended that staff and students should be involved in the appointment, including the members of interview panels, and appraisal of principals. 
Um, I think in the draft code it says that they should be uh, staff and students should be consulted, or you said taken account of. I mean, I, I, these are not necessarily the same things. No, but we do say that there should be staff and student membership of the nominations committee, uh, coming from the main court, if you like. That they absolutely should be one of each on the nominations committee and two of each on the court. That, that's an absolute recommendation that we've made. Mm. Now, when, it, when we get into the realms of remuneration, that's where it gets slightly tricky. When we uh, consulted on this, there were uh, student representatives who were a bit concerned about their position, about whether they could actually act in a remuneration committee. Frankly, if I were the, the principal of a university, I would allow both staff and student representatives on a, a remuneration committee, me personally, but we're not in a position to absolutely force that. And I think there will be situations where a staff member may feel it quite difficult, quite embarrassed commenting on things, where a union representative sitting in a REMCO may actually find it difficult to act as a member of that and forget the position they have outside because it's quite a, a difficult uh, role to, to, to have. And I, I've been in many, many boards where people are effectively representatives of organisations and find it quite difficult to leave that at the door outside. But there absolutely should be influenced by students and, and, and by staff. And if I could just, you know, this is a thing I actually feel quite passionately about. I know I'm going on a bit, but you can shut me up as chairman in two course. I own the, uh, the Chancellor, which is no role at all, it's purely ceremonial, uh, at the University of the West of Scotland. But we have a number of outlying campuses, uh, places like Hamilton, uh, Dumfries and uh, Ayr, and indeed Paisley. And I've seen the effect that we have in those areas. The effect on the economy, for example, in Dumfries, if our university was not there, would be, would be catastrophic. Youngsters in those areas will not go to Glasgow to go to university. They feel that Glasgow is quite alien. I object to that, of course, as a proposition being a Glaswegian, but it, they do find it quite difficult to, to move to the big smoke to go to university. So if you're in that position, you have to reach out to the community, you have to reach out to local councils, you have to reach out to local youngsters, and I think that's why staff and students should be mightily represented and listened to on all universities, but particularly in those that have a real uh, pastoral care. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Uh, can I bring in Robin Parker on this? Because clearly the NUS written evidence on this, um, you were uh, how can I put it, extremely concerned um, about what seemed to be the lack of direct input by both students and staff. Well, firstly, uh, let me thank the committee for having me along today. Um, I think the first thing I was going to point to is just something actually from, uh, not, my, not my own words or not NUS's uh, words, but from the letter that was put in by the presidents of the student associations. And I think they said in terms of the, um, the consultation, uh, we do not think the quantity of these visits should become a misnomer for their quality or indeed the end product. Um, and I think it's important today that we, we remain focused on the, the end product, um, although I think in terms of legislation, given that this kind of process, which I think has been really led by the chairs, um, and therefore I think is, is rightly perceived really as a self-regulation a self process, um, in terms of where governance goes next, we can't continue that kind of self-regulation process. It needs to be um, a process which fully belongs to the entirety of the um, the higher education sector, which includes staff and students who, who participate and, and really make higher education what higher education is. Um, specifically on the points around um, staff and student involvement, just for, for maybe a bit of clarity, um, the draft code does um, point to the involvement of staff and students in the nominations for the appointment of the chairs. Um, so that's a, that's a small step forward there, but the, um, where, where it doesn't um, address is the two students who there being two students on our university courts. Um, some university courts have, have two students, some don't. However, that I think is a matter for legislation because the membership of um, university courts is, is, is something that is a matter of legislation. The big oversight I think is really in terms of the appointment of principals where it merely says um, uh, staff and students should be consulted or should be, um, uh, uh, says, says they should be consulted rather than in von Pronzinski, it says they should be full members of the interview panel and I think is in fact this process has demonstrated um, being consulted isn't necessarily the same as being involved. Okay. Mary? 
Um, yeah, no, thank you. I, mean, I think, yeah, Rob, Robin's highlighted um, important points, and indeed, I think when Lord Smith was making his um, comments uh, just a wee while ago, um, he was indicating um, how, you know, he would act, and, you know, it, it's really good to hear that, but, you know, I, th I think why we need um, a strong code of governance is because, um, you know, we haven't experienced... Um, or staff haven't felt that they've experienced strong and fair and transparent governance and that's why it's really important that um, the recommendations from the von Prondinsky um, report are um, encapsulated where possible um, in this draft code. Um, and actually, in some ways, I, I find it quite insulting that um, there's this view that trade unions actually can't play full and meaningful roles on courts and governing bodies. Indeed, the von Prondinsky um, recommendations are for two uh, student members of court, two staff members, uh, one uh, trade union representative from academic uh, staff and one trade union representative from support staff unions. And that's because I think they recognise the unique role that trade unions can actually play in governing bodies. Um, they can say things and um, represent the views in perhaps a, a different way uh, from ordinary staff members. And I think that's really important. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's concerning that, that it hasn't been recognised at all in the draft code. Indeed, the draft code um, doesn't actually use the word trade union, doesn't really even recognise that trade unions exist um, in our higher education institutions. The only time the word appears um, is in the annex when it's talking about uh, meetings that, that have um, taken place. So, you know, I, I think we, we, we really do need to grapple with that issue because trade unions can play important roles on uh, governing bodies and, and it, you know, it seems to... Um, have been um, watered down. Um, perhaps I should also say, express the concerns in relation to um, the rectors of um, a number of universities that, that currently exist. Our, our concerns were that currently um, rectors are elected by staff, by sorry, by students um, in Edinburgh. They're also elected by staff, and, and they currently chair um, the governing body. And, and actually, the, in, in the, the draft code. Um, that role seems to be taken away from them in that they wouldn't automatically chair the governing body. They could uh, be considered for, for chairing the governing body, uh, but that wouldn't automatically happen. So I think that's why we felt this was um, a real step backwards because von Prondinsky recommends that um, all chairs of governing bodies are um, elected um, and perhaps even by a broader constituency than just by students or, or and, and staff. Um, so... Um, you know, that, the recommendation in, in the draft code um, is um, a step back in that respect. Can I just, Simon, just before I bring in, can I just go back to Lord Smith and can, can we try and nail this particular issue before we bring other members in about this election uh, process and what's been recommended and what's not been recommended in the draft code? Is it the case that effectively the current situation where in some institutions there's an automatic chairing court, is that, is that being taken away? Just, absolutely not. Absolutely not. But having reread the thing, I think we'll have to change the language that we've written here. I'm going to ask Simon to come back because he, he was a rector. But I think what we were concerned about was a confusion. There were students voting for a rector and they thought that that rector was then going to be chairing all manner of things. And it just wasn't the case in some cases. So I think in a, in a business of being honest with the electorate, if you like, if nothing else, we were saying, for goodness sake, tell people what the chair does, if there is a chair of court, of what the rector does, and be up front with it when you're actually going for election. But Simon, you've been there. Uh, <clears throat> if I could just add to that. Uh, the situation with the rectors is that the legislation, actually it's 19th century legislation, um, provides for the rector elected by the students, or in the case of Edinburgh, by the students and the staff, to preside at meetings of the court. Now, uh, I don't think in the entire history since then there, is, there have been many rectors that have, been, have agreed to undertake all of the functions of chair that are now described in the Code of Governance. So individual institutions have always made their own negotiation with the incoming rector and they've been of various kinds ranging, well, to use a Glasgow ex uh, recent experience from you know, somebody who was in prison in Israel for the entire period of the rectorship 
to uh, currently a former um, leader of a UK political party. So different rectors arrive with different capacities and different willingness to engage in these things. But what the code is trying to say is before you proceed very far, just make it entirely clear where you are agreeing that the role of rector starts and finishes and where the senior lay member or senior governor or convener or whatever you're calling that, that person appointed by the governing body takes over and undertakes the remainder of the chairing functions that are described in the code. It's important that all of these functions are covered. We felt that the code would be derelict in its duty if it didn't draw attention to a potential conflict here or confusion at least. Can and you just and so it comes that. this committee and Robin and Mary, there will be a rewrite of that yeah. section because it was absolutely not our intention to undermine rectors. Yeah. Absolutely not. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Simon, sorry. I wonder if I may go back, back to the question, please, about um, specific nominations because uh, um, the nominations of, of particular interests that should have places on particular committees and so on. We are entirely, uh, the whole uh, steering group is entirely agreeing with the principle that inclusion and participation should be maximised. No question at all. I think Lord Smith has already made that point. The issue really is about how you then put those principles into practice. And one option, fair enough, would be to specify, to prescribe exactly which nomination, which uh, uh, member, uh, which members of which committees should come from which sources. Another option, which we have favoured, actually, is to say the really important thing here is the uh, values and uh, sense of collegiate, I think this was a word that Mary Senior himself, herself used, a collegiate responsibility and collegiate behaviour and a sharing of the uh, corporate responsibility of the governing body, how that works. We all know that good governing bodies work best because they inculcate this shared culture of collective responsibility. And our feeling is that by the number of measures that we've introduced, which each one might be quite a small one, as some people have said, but together what they represent is a significant advance on what is currently required under the CUC code. And we are sure that the result will be a change, a significant change in the culture of the management of governing bodies. And as a result, the sorts of outcomes that uh, our colleagues are, are exactly looking for. More inclusion, more con uh, consultation in significant ways, which are perhaps better achieved that way than by mechanistic appointment of certain quotas in certain places. Ms. Smith. Smith, um, when uh, you published your new code, um, it was my understanding that uh, Professor von Brzezinski uh, actually was quite complimentary about the vast majority of it, albeit he, he flagged up some key issues that he wanted uh, to have uh, amended. Uh, is that your understanding too? That's my understanding. Actually, I, I wouldn't want to quote the man, but uh, he did write to me saying I'm genuinely very impressed. I think you've done a really good job in capturing many of the key elements of the HE governance report. The code's well written and accessible, it's practical, allow institutions to be effective and decisive as well as demonstrating integrity and accountability. I do know that he's quite a number of small points that he, he actually wants to guide us on and I'm sure we'll take these on board because it will improve the language and I mean the most glaring example is, is the one about, uh, about rectors. I, you know, if I, I didn't read that, it wasn't the intention, but if that's the message that's coming across then it's plain wrong and we've got to change it. Given that obviously that there is a consultation period uh, to continue with the, with the new code up till June sometime, um, do you believe that you could work with uh, Professor von Brzezinski to come to uh, a decision about trying to improve uh, the, the existing new code, if you can use that word, um, so that it would be better? Better. We might not go 100% of the way uh, because we took an awful lot of evidence. Uh, but yes, I think the sort of things he's already written to me uh, privately with a number of these uh, issues, and I don't think there's anything there that I couldn't persuade the committee to, to go along with. Mr. Parker, could I just come back to this? Uh, given uh, what Lord Smith has just said in terms of the fact that uh, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of difference between um, the von Brzezinski uh, version and uh, the new code. Uh, you're saying that you very definitely uh, cannot support the proposed code in its current form. Um, there seems to be a slight mismatch there. 
I think in our the evidence from NUS Scotland, I think we're quite clear about which um, matters, which issues we we think haven't been addressed in the, in the draft code. Um, I I think if the if the same, uh, I think it's welcome um, that with Lord Smith's talking about picking up on the issue around the rectors. So I think that's addressed one of our points. And I'd, well, I'd, I'd hope that perhaps the same approach can be taken with our other points. So if, if we can find something where um, staff and students can be involved in the interview panels of um, the, uh, the principal, and I think making that more clear, making that more tangible, because I think that's a really tangible recommendation that would help things. Um, I think really things, things have to be picked up around uh, remuneration. I mean, I, it, involving staff and student remuneration panels is the approach of von Pronzinski, but it's an issue that I think is really just glossed over in terms of um, the code entirely. And I think when we're in a situation when um, all universities in Scotland continue to receive a large amount of public funding, I think it's not surprising at all that the public uh, and that indeed the MSPs are asking questions about the amount of uh, remuneration that happens. For, there's 88 um, members of staff in universities who receive more than the First Minister in terms of re remuneration. That seems to be going far too far. So, you know, something, something needs to be done to tackle that issue. Um, there's one proposal from ourselves, but if, you know, if this, this code could clearly go further than it does at the moment in terms of tackling that issue. And I think exactly the same point uh, applies for the, um, the uh, fair representation of, of gender in terms of um, governing bodies, is that it, it kind of glosses, it, I think it doesn't actually even mention the issue, I think it talks more generally about diversity and equality, and of course, um, we'd want all forms of diversity, all, to, all forms of equality to take, take an account of here because it's about um, our governing bodies at our universities reflecting the staff who work in the universities, reflecting the students and sort of more widely reflecting the public that our universities serve. Um, I think it's incredibly important that much more significant, much more tangible steps, um, this code needs to go as far as possible in terms of tackling these issues and gender is a particularly apparent issue when there's not a single woman chairing a university court in Scotland. We need some really tangible things to tackle that kind of issue in this code. But Mr Parker, I, I accept what you say. I don't say I agree with every point you're making, but there is still time to consult. Um, is it your hope that at the end of the three weeks or four weeks, however long it is till that consultation period is uh, finished, that you will come closer together? I'd, I'd hope that all of the points that we're making, um, because I think they are in keeping with um, what needs to happen to the higher education sector, I think it's what, what, what needs to happen for, for the higher education sector to um, maintain its autonomy. Because I think one of the, the, one of, one of the issues here could be is if, if I, I think if issues like remuneration, if it, it, the, the other issues I, I've, I've outlined, if they're not tackled by us as a higher education sector, then I think it would be, it, I think it would almost be an expectation um, that the political process would, would make things more clear in terms of saying, you know, on the issue of remuneration, I wouldn't be surprised if the code didn't tackle that issue if amendments came forward from MSPs, and I think that would be the right thing to do. So could, could I just finish on the point, would it be your understanding that it would be helpful to the committee and certainly to Parliament to have that information and that consultation period complete before we finally agree? Um, uh, the, the timescales run very, very closely together. I, I, th I think actually, one, actually, what I'd say, I think the most important thing in terms of legislation is making it clear about how this, um, how the code sort of updates itself and how the, the code, the process continues onwards. And I think the experience of this is that it can't just be um, a, a code that is led, it will led in the main by the chairs themselves. That's far too much of a, a self-regulation role. We need, uh, role. We need to have a, a system that balances the, well, certainly ensures that staff and students are involved in the maintenance of the code um, and also ensures that there's appropriate uh, public involvement as well, I think. We, we need to decide next week uh, on our approach to stage two, particularly on, on the governance. It is not helpful to us that there is still some slight dubiety about how things are going to move together in the consultation period. I, I, yes. <laughs> Just for, just for clarity, though, of course, MSPs can't amend the code. It's not, it's not in statute in that sense, so we can't amend it. So just, you did say that we could amend it, but that's not actually the case. I mean, in terms of making it clear in the bill that this is um, that the code um, should be and the maintenance of the code um, should involve staff and students, I think that that would be possible, perhaps, and making sure that it's something that belongs to the sector. Liam MacArthur. Just following up on that. 
Yes. Um, that, that line, I think I'm, I'm getting you right. You weren't advocating an increase in the salary for the First Minister, uh, Robin. But in, in, terms of this, in terms of this time frame, um, you, you, you listened to um, Professor von Pranzinski this morning suggesting that while he still stood by all of his recommendations, he was acknowledging that some of those were always expected to be taken forward through, through legislation and, and therefore presumably with, with some of the, uh, the, the, the changes that have already been indicated, not just in terms of rectors, but in terms of um, staff and, and, and student involvement in the appointments process, which uh, I think he was very strong on in, in his evidence. The other aspects of that, he, he was envisaging coming through in the legislation uh, anyway. So on that basis, do you not see um, the potential for reaching agreement on a, a, an updated code with a focus on the amendments to the legislation that, that you and perhaps you see you and others feel uh, are necessary? Well, I, I don't have the, um, the legal expertise that, that Professor von Pronzinski has, but it certainly seems to me that on the issues of uh, around the diversity and equality of, of boards, particularly on the gender issue and you know, around the remuneration issue, they're both issues where the code could go a lot further as well. So uh, I think what, actually, what, I'll, what I'll turn to is, is the letter that I put together with um, Ian McWhirter and Terry Brotherston and that uh, committee members will have seen um, that finishes with we continue to hope and expect that the full recommendations of the von Pronzinski review will be implemented as an integrated package, whether that is through legislation or through a combination of legislation and a revised code. So there's two, Just, words, which, two which words there. potentially suggests that there's, there's more scope for an agreement around a, a, a further improved or updated code than was perhaps evident from some of the kind of public statements immediately after the code came out. Would that be fair? Well, I think these are, these are really significant from my point of view and the point of view of the students I represent in terms of deficiencies in, in the code as it currently sits. Um, and I think the question is whether those are, those are points that are going to be addressed or not. Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, yeah, I mean, I welcome the discussion we've had today and um, that Lord Smith has indicated that there can be changes, but I'm deeply concerned um, for you to sort of go away to us and say reach agreement because, you know, the NUS and the trade unions are not involved mm -hmm after this point, okay, we'll put in our written submission to um, the chairs of court by the date, which I think is the 11th of June, but then, you know, do we just then hope that they take on board our recommendations because, you know, there's, we don't really know that they're actually going to do that. Um, I mean, UCU wrote to Lord Smith um, back in September to, to ask to meet him, and today is the first time that, we, that we've met him. So, um, you know, I think Professor von Promdinsky um, indicated his concerns in relation to the timescales, and you know, I do think the committee's got a very, very difficult decision. But um, you know, we're deeply concerned that um, there's going to be reference in the bill to um, a code or to principles that you know we're we're not happy with. Uh, we had such uh, a tremendous opportunity here um, with. To, to put together a code and to make it meaningful and to make it make a difference. Um, and I'm really concerned that what we've got um, is actually not making any significant change to what already already happens. Um, and, you know, I said we've had some useful discussions today. However, I'm not sure um, in, in the short time scale that we've got um, that, that there is a process for us to reach agreement um, you know, I, I suppose I'm not trying to be difficult, but that, that's just um, my concern. And, um, you know, I know my members would be um, concerned that what we've got here, that they're concerned if that's what we're going to get in, in August, which obviously is, is, is also the, the holiday period. Um, and, and, you know, we do need to have further scrutiny um, of um, the draft code. Can, can I just go back? We, we've made some helpful progress on rectors, I think, this morning. Thank you very much, Lord Smith, for that. But uh, two other points that Robin just raised there um, were uh, interviews and uh, remuneration, if I remember rightly. I saw you scribbling those down. I just wondered if you have any views you want to express at this point, given you've been so helpful on rectors. It's not a concession, necessarily. No, no, no. I, I just, not, I just noticed that you noticed Simon, do you, do you want to talk to them? both these subjects? Because oh, uh, I mean, without getting down into the detail of it, which might take some, some further time, I, I do think that in both cases, I mean, uh, the 
response we've had, I don't think the evidence to the committee comprises the full response to the consultation which we have out at present. So we're looking forward to hearing the supporting arguments behind some of the points that are being made today, and indeed others if they want to raise it. The, the, the group's uh, doors are open for views to suggest improvements, and we genuinely want to be listening to that and, and doing that. So I would be hopeful that we can get close the gap that, uh, that you were talking about earlier. But I think there's another issue here, which is, you know, in the end, it will be a matter of judgment uh, for the Parliament, for yourselves as well, as to whether uh, we are moving far enough with this new code or not. We would claim that we're moving significantly further and that the changes we've made, not, not excluding, of course, the fact that this code will now be compulsory, which it wasn't in the past, that this will cause a major shift in the culture of governing bodies in Scotland. And if in three to five years, what, if that is the case, the code is to be reviewed anyway in the light of its early years experience, then that's another uh, safeguard, if you like, to it. If it, the, in, with the proof being in the pudding, if it, the pudding turns out not to be as expected, then it can always be adjusted in years to come. But our firm uh, advice and confidence is that this will lead to the sorts of changes that are being sought here without being too prescriptive. And bear in mind, we're talking about a very diverse sector with a variety of ways of operating. But it should be about continuous improvement. We have one of the clauses we'll put in here is that uh, every three years, I mean, every year, these boards should be looking at themselves, and, and you know, but th that's too cosy. Every three years, an externally facilitated look at actually how they're performing should be necessary. And I, I think we need to watch them. If, if this is in place in August, uh, you know, give peace a chance. But if it's not working, then, you know, something else has to be done. <coughs> Excuse. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much for that. Neil Bobby. A couple of questions. The first one I was going to talk about uh, or ask is uh, one of the one of the recommendations around uh, meetings in public and how that was different from what Professor von Brzezinski had in his report. He said he's changed his mind, um, talking about implications for staff. Given that we've just heard uh, from the UCU saying that they are keen to have um, all meetings in public and there shouldn't be meetings behind closed doors. What's your what's your view on that? We had an overwhelming uh, response from our consultation against it. What we've tried to say is, look, you're part of a community, so you have to publish your agenda, you have to publish minutes, you have to at least consult with people, and I don't just mean the university, I mean in the surrounding district, if you like, stakeholders, wider people, uh, when you're talking about changes to things. Uh, but the overwhelming evidence was, don't do public meetings. Uh, it's, you know, there were examples, I think, in Luxembourg, there was a supervisory, it turned out to be almost a supervisory board. In other areas, they had to abandon it because people would not criticise people in front of witnesses and so on. Now, you know, I, I know that in politics, uh, you people are doing this all the time, you know, it's absolutely open, but maybe these are more precious environments. I don't know, but it, I, I would not like, for example, a lot of my private sector board meetings to be in public, because you can have an awful lot of uh, discussion and argument, if you like, behind closed doors. And then you, you hope you present a united face. Uh, to do that, perhaps with management and uh, you know, the, the, the court uh, challenging them and so on in public may be very difficult. But we've gone as far as I feel we could against the consultation, and we've said publish agendas so that people can actually have a say about things, publish minutes, and I would have thought there's maybe an argument for saying once a year or something, you have an open, absolutely open meeting, and let's see if that works. And if it, but if, it, it, if the effect of it is to drive the real decisions underground, then we won't have made any progress, and that was our concern. Okay, yeah, just, just very briefly, I, I, I wanted to take us right back to the starting point for why I think we need all of these improvements to, to governance in, in Scotland. I think that part of that goes back to the starting point being that there is still hundreds of millions of pounds of, of public funding going into universities in Scotland, quite rightly. Um, and where, this, where all this has to come from is that there has to be, therefore, a much higher 
democratic and transparent approach to governance than there would be in the, in the private sector. And I think that's where, where, where can we increase that has to, is, is the drive for all of this. And I think that's where the proposal around um, holding meetings in public comes from. But really where I wanted to go with this is that one of the things in, in what Mr. Pepper was saying um, that jarred slightly was um, the, the question of whether there should be a voluntary code or not. Um, uh, or a compulsory code or not, I'm sorry. Uh, and I think actually in, in the presumption so far from uh, the Committee of Scottish Chairs has been that it would be a voluntary code on a comply or explain basis. And actually I think it's really important um, for a whole number of reasons, not least that fundamental starting point, that fundamental principle of there is huge amounts of public funding quite rightly going into universities in Scotland, um, that this needs to be something that is a, is a condition of grant to universities that they have to, have to comply with. And particularly when we're talking about things like publishing minutes, publishing um, agendas for, for meetings, uh, the, what that points to is that that isn't taking place everywhere right now. And so when we're setting the bar that low, then I think it has to absolutely be an expectation that universities will comply with that. And that's not about flexibility, because it, otherwise if, if you leave it too much to flexibility, then this will all, all disappear in a, in a sort of, a, I think it's been described elsewhere as a sea of ambiguity. And I think we need to be really clear and really tangible on some of these things, otherwise it won't happen. Simon, sorry, one second, and then... I just wanted quickly to respond to the comply or explain point because for me that, that, that is not an option to, to opt out. It, it's an option to explain how you are meeting the requirements of the code but perhaps in a different way from what's prescribed in the code. So it, it, it doesn't weaken it at all but it does leave it with the judges, external scrutin scrutineers, SFC or whoever, to say whether they are satisfied that the method that's being chosen to comply with the code is perhaps different in some way from the way that's being prescribed in the code. Sure. So I, I hope I that's reassuring. It should be a condition of grant from the SFC, yeah. just to, to say so. It would be another point I would actually agree on. Now, you then have comply or explain, and if they're explaining why they haven't done it, the SFC has got to use its discretion. Yeah. And I guess that's where the ambiguity comes in. But if you have a very small, very narrowly based institution that feels that it can't go the whole way in this stuff, or a larger one that feels it's got a lot of private money coming in or something, you may have difficulty. But I would have thought the SFC should police this. And, you know, you, you don't get the money unless you, you comply. Again, thank you very much. That's, I think that's helpful. Sorry, Neil. Yeah. Um Obviously, we've, we've heard concerns from the UCU, EIS, NUS, student presidents. Three out of the five members of the uh, von Pronsinski review about the draft code. What, can I ask you, Mr. Pepper, Lord Smith, what, what, why do you think there is th that level of, of concern about the code? Well, you, you can read the, the evidence they've given. They're, they're concerned about union representation on various committees. They're concerned also about student in one case and, and staff representation being... Uh, perhaps stronger say on the remuneration committee and, and so on. I, I have to tell you that, you know, I've been inundated with people who've been writing to me and phoning me and saying they think it's a workable code, it's been well researched, it's, it's easily understandable and it will actually work. And I would imagine there are some uh, courts around in, in universities right now who are wondering just exactly what they're going to make of this because I think this pushes it quite you know, I, I know you don't agree with me, Robin and Mary, but I actually think this pushes some courts rather But Simon. Well, no, I, I agree. I, I think if I was in, in the shoes of the critics that you've referred to, I would be doing exactly the same. I would be wanting to push this as far as, as, far as I could. But I think what they are kind of um, slightly mis, un, mis, uh, uh, underestimating is the force that collectively this package of measures that we're introducing will have. I think that, as I said, I'm very confident that it will cause a major change. And we know that some universities have looked at the draft and are saying that they will have to pull their socks up. And that's what we're looking for. You're, you're obviously saying this is you know, workable and you've had positive feedback uh, about it, and I'm, you know, I wouldn't do that for, for, for a minute. But we've obviously hearing you're, you're saying that, and we're hearing evidence from unions and, and uh, people in the von Prinzinski review who are raising concerns about it. Do you can you can you see why we would maybe be reluctant to proceed with this if there's no if there's no consensus if there's two there's two different opinions here if we've got stalemate 
Could you see why? I'm and and Paul Ranciski himself said, you know, he wouldn't be. I don't want to misquote him, but he was talking about, you know, the general principles need to be established, you know, before before proceeding. But we obviously haven't got the finalised code, and we've not also got a degree of consensus amongst amongst the, the sector. Well, I, I'm not a politician, so I, I don't know how you go with legislation. I don't understand all that. All I can say is that this code has been arrived at, you know, by honest people doing as much research as they can. There's been no, I think someone described it as an establishment stitch-up. Well, for a boy from Mary Hill, let me tell you, I didn't know I'd arrived in the establishment, but maybe I've progressed a lot since I left there. But people who know me know that I, I don't get pushed around on things. So I, I, I honestly believe that we've arrived at this genuinely looking at the evidence. Now, if it's not good enough, or people are not complying with it, or the SFC don't apply pressure on the thing, then I think it's got to be revisited. There are several, I think there were 19 recommendations that we took, and I think we've either completely accepted them or addressed them in what we believe, subject to a little bit more negotiation and so on, we believe are, are the right ways to deal with them. The others, things like Privy Council, things like various things that actually require legislation, still have to be dealt with elsewhere. But we've done our best with the 19 that we thought we could actually apply. This could be in place by August, uh, if it's not working shortly thereafter, people will know that. Uh, I don't know how long legislation takes in these things, but it may well be that the whole thing is delayed. Uh, I would hope we get something that is actually going to be workable. I can't help you with your legislation. If you feel that the things are not agreed and you have to make a decision next Tuesday, hey, I, I, I don't know where you go from there. But uh, I think I've indicated that there are several areas that uh, Ferdinand has, has fed to us that I think we can accommodate, though they are relatively minor. Uh, you've heard us on the, the uh, rector issue, and that's a complete rewrite. You have heard that we will look at some areas. Uh, my belief is that we already have two members on the nominations committee. Let me follow that through and see what that means in terms of interview panel and so on, because I don't know if I quite understand that but they are actually on the nominations committee. Uh, the REMCO, I think, is, is a more difficult one, uh, but I'll look at it. And uh, I'm quite happy to you know, engage in some conversation. What I don't particularly want to do is we see all the unions in one block, then the chairs need to see us, and then staff needs to see us who are not in unions, and you know, I, I'll, I'll never deliver the thing in June. Just, just to... Um just to follow up quickly, um, obviously you, you mentioned you've been uh, been in dialogue with um, Professor von Brunzinski and you've, you've, you've taken on board what the unions are saying. Um, there's one person we've not mentioned in the past two hours is the, is the Cabinet Secretary for Education who understand will have the power to sign off the code. What's, have you spoken to him? Has he given well, I've views? had a couple of conversations with him. I think uh, you've got to be very careful, of course, quoting a politician, but I understood him to say that a lot of the code he was happy with, he felt the language was not aspirational enough. He was very concerned about the rector uh, thing, and I think he wanted to just get more towards the remuneration area. So actually some pretty common themes coming through there. The rector thing I think we've dealt with. The aspirational thing, I'll look at the language again. Uh, I've said on the record that I will be bitterly disappointed if this does not move the needle quite a bit in terms of female percentages, in terms of involve, genuinely involving students and staff and, and opening the thing up a little more. But it's up to them to set their goals. But if it doesn't move the needle, then someone else is going to have to pick this up and take it forward. And who initiated the contact with the Cabinet Secretary? Did he approach you or did, or did you? I actually can't him? remember. I think it was a kind of... I think he got in touch with me, but it, it wouldn't matter. I mean, it just simply, I wanted him to know that we were looking at the thing seriously because I, you know, he hadn't heard anything. So, is it improper for the cabinet secretary to be in touch with me? Some people seem to think it is, uh, Lord Smith. But there you go. Well, well I. <laughs> Um, if, any other questions? Just, no, just one final point. Um, <coughs> Mary Senior suggested that she had written to you and um, that there hadn't been that engagement. Um, trying to be a conciliator as all as am. Is that possible that that can happen now? I look. It, 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 Neil, it's logistics as far, far from anything else. I mean, I, and, I, and what I don't want is, you know, we have. And I'm not trying to. I know you. As soon as I don't answer questions straight, you'll call me a lawyer, but. 
and I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, that much. <laughs> but he, it, what I want to avoid is if, if I have direct dialogue with unions only, then what happens? I have to go back to chairs of court. I have to go back to non-union members. You know, come on, come on. This is a significant group of people who are the academic backbone of these institutions. Surely, surely, in all of this, you must speak to these people directly. Surely. Going a bit further as well, it's one of the principles that we're setting out in the code, um, and I think it's recognised by by everyone, is that staff and students are involved in, in every level of the process. And it's something that for a very long time in Scotland has been, it, it, it's complicated in how it does it for staff, and I think UCE would like to see it go further, but staff and students have always been involved in, in the governing bodies of universities. I think we should be taking that same principle to the next level up in terms of who, how and how this code is maintained and how this code is decided upon. Well, Mr. Can I take it away? I've heard you very clearly, and let's see what we can do about that, about actually having a direct dialogue, as long as it doesn't wreck the whole timetable and, and you know, consultation in other areas. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to give you a direct answer right here, but I've heard you very loud and clear. Thank you very much. Can I uh, thank all the panel members for coming along this morning? We do appreciate very much your time in trying to assist us with the discussion of the draft code. Um, we do appreciate it very much, as I've said. And can I suspend the meeting briefly? The, uh, the next item for consideration is our approach to uh, the Children and Young People Scotland Bill at Stage 1. Um, we have a paper uh, before us from the CLAPS, which is effectively the usual call for evidence. Um, do members have any comments on that? Okay, uh, 
effectively members content with the draft call for written evidence? Agreed. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item uh, four this morning is uh, consideration of a legislative consent memorandum on the UK Children and Families Bill. The committee, as you remember, last considered the LCM at its meeting on the 16th of April. The committee agreed to seek clarification from the Scottish Government on the implications for cross-border adoptions that may need to take place in the Children and Families Bill. Um, and of course that's because of the different, the different policy process and procedures that Scotland has compared to the rest of the UK. Um, members will be aware we now have a response from the Scottish Government which has been uh, included with your papers this week. Uh, are there any comments from members uh, about that response or the LCM in general? Uh, Liam. Thanks, Kevin. I think I raised a couple of the points when this came before us last time. I, I think the, uh, uh, the, the, the final paragraph in setting out the arrangements for um, uh, adoptions north and south of the border, and particularly uh, those that require more specialist matching, is, is very help, helpful in terms of uh, the reassurances provided. And I note that carve-out is a commonly used when describing amendments to legislation, so I uh, can look forward to that being part of the, uh, the, uh, the lexicon of expressions in relation to the Constitution. So thanks very much. Any other members wish to comment on this? Okay. Um, the clerks will now draft a, a report to the Parliament on the LCM, and this will be circulated to members prior to publication. Um, as the committee has agreed to hold the next item in private, I now close the meeting to the public.